Um, Joe called me uh, towards the end of August and asked if I wanted to do one of a pair of teachings. Uh, the other teaching with Chris will do in 1848 in a few weeks. So 1789 and 1848 form an obvious pair, in fact, both things historically, but also thematically. In, you could say, 1789 is the revolution that succeeded, and 1848 is the revolution that failed. But there are lots of other juxtapositions. An even more important thematic aspect, of course, is that 1848 is the beginning of Marxism, basically, I mean, it's the 1840s. And <clears throat> 1789, in a certain sense, is the beginning of the category of the left. Um, and I wanted to talk about that, but um, first I wanted to, to frame the conversation by two quotations. The one quotation here is from Karl Marx. It's from an early work of his uh, remarks on the King of Prussia and social reform, I think. So it's about 1844, so it was about 26. Um, it's not his definitive statement, but I think that it's a very sharp observation and concise. And I think it um, describes a lot about certain aspect of the Marxist understanding of the revolution. Um, and it's actually quite a, a deep statement that needs to be unpacked in many ways. The classical period of political understanding is the French Revolution. Far from identifying the principle of the state as the source of social ills, the heroes of the French Revolution held social ills to be the source of political problems. Thus, Robespierre regarded great wealth and great poverty as obstacles to pure democracy. He therefore wished to establish a universal system of Spartan frugality. The principle of politics is the will, the more one-sided, i.e. the more perfect political understanding is, the more completely it puts its faith in the omnipotence of the will, the blinder it is towards the natural and spiritual limitations of the will, the more incapable it becomes of discovering the real source of the evils of society. And um, obviously when Marx wrote that in the 1840s, the whole political imagination of the left, there wasn't Marx, I think, because it had to be invented by Marx and Engels, but was dominated by the memory of the French Revolution. And chronologically, if you think about it, the great events of the French Revolution were about half a century earlier. So he's looking back on the Jacobins the same way we would look back, say, on the 60s, the 1960s, in terms of giving you a sense of, you know, some of the, you know, you say mid-20s now, looking back on the 1960s and feeling that the entire political imagination of the present is formed by that. The second quotation, if you have it, or I'll read it. Um, um, go ahead. Okay, so this is a, 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 a quotation from a book by Arno Meyer, who's an interesting historian, sort of leftist, uh, influenced by Marxism, very eccentric kind, but, but, but definitely profoundly influenced by Marxism. And it's from a book that appeared about 15 years ago, I think, a decade and a half ago, I don't remember the exact date. And um, it's a comparison, it's called The Furies, it's a comparison of violence and terror in the French and Russian revolutions. And he writes, in this early dawn of the 21st century, following one of humanity's darkest seasons, revolution is seen as offering little promise and posing little threat. But only yesteryear, during the discontinuous, yet not unrelated epochs of the French and Russian revolutions, promise and threat were vigorous and inextricably entwined. Indeed, revolution presents two contrasting faces, the one glorious and appealing, the other violent and terrifying. Today, utopia is completely eclipsed by dystopia. In much of the first and second world, there is a consensus articulated by Hannah Arendt that freedom has been better preserved in countries where no revolution ever broke out, no matter how outrageous the circumstances of the powers that be, and that more civil liberties exist even in countries where the revolution was defeated than in those where revolutions have been victorious. Revolution is seen as unnecessary, and its human and material costs morally and historically indefensible. The grand romance and the great fear of the French and Russian revolutions has given way to the celebration of essentially bloodless revolutions for human rights, private property, and market capitalism. 
This perspective rooted in liberal and conservative values precludes the revolutionary premise and is as prejudicial to the critical study of revolution as the revolutionary premise itself. And I think that these two quotations frame in different historical periods classical attitudes to the problem of revolution. So, I mean, on the one hand, you have this quotation. By the way, um, at the uh, bicentenary of the French Revolution, Daniel Rocard, a, a, a leader of the French Socialist Party, uh, said that the importance of remembering the French Revolution is to realize like, why you didn't want to have a French Revolution. Have a revolution. Um, and um, then this here is sort of the, a, a classic Marxist understanding, I mean, it's early Marx, but it, I think that the subsequent Marxist understanding sort of turns around, it, which is that, that the French Revolution is something classic, um, that it's the, the, the model that in some way influences all future development, and that it's both great and limited, right? And that the limitation is a kind of misunderstanding by its political actor, a kind of tragic misunderstanding of the true character of their actions and limitations. Um, uh, by, by the way, this is somewhat of a digression, but I think people in Plato's will appreciate this. So the, one of the historians who's known as one of the leading revisionists, Francois Faure, in his book on Marx and uh, the French Revolution, speaks of Marx as the heir of um, Rousseau, Hegel, and Benjamin Constant, which is perfect in terms of the plot of syllabus. Um, so I want to get go, go back, and I'm going to talk just a bit in abstract, so one of the questions Dave asked was, why do we study, should we do this teaching on the French Revolution? And that's sort of central to what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk in the beginning sort of abstractly about the, the French Revolution and then somewhat go through a narrative about sort of what happened, um, which will try to be focused on events, but also thematic. Um, so, in some ways, like, like of these two teachings, the, the task I have, I feel, is harder because, because Marxism emerges with already some kind of a conception of a life, some kind of a conception of revolution. Um, the, the, the Marxism is a, is a critique within the left, <coughs> a certain segment of the left, of the inadequacy of hitherto existing notions of the left. The notion of the left, though, is, in, is, is, is an even greater novum in history. So I want to talk about like three categories. Um, so you have, um, right, so you have on the one hand politics. Um, you have class struggle, and then you have the left, which also includes the right, because the right really couldn't have existed before the left. Um, and the first two of these are very ancient categories, right? So politics and class struggle have been going on for a very long time. The existence of a, of a category of the left, and what we think of in terms of politics, right, is something that's really new, and that basically dates back to um, the French Revolution. Hello. If so, if you if you you know if for example, right, you know, Marx has the line in the in the comes manifesto of history of all has to exist in society, being the history of classroom. So you can find examples of classroom, right, in, in long before the French Revolution. Um, you know, you can find uh, peasant revolts, slave revolts, uh, the struggle between burghers and, and the feudal aristocracy, all types of different manifestations. If you look at the ancient world, which was a highly political society, like ancient Athens, you find both democracy and you find both politics and class struggle, and even the notion of democracy. What you don't have, I think, is a notion of a left. 
In other words, that it's not as though the, the Greek Democrats really were the left, even though they represented a more populist sensibility. It's not as though Spartacus really was the left, right? So the, the left is something new in human history. And um, I say it begins with the, his, with the French Revolution. The, the one exception to that, which I think needs to be qualified, is that to a certain extent, if you look at the British Revolution of the 17th century, you find a kind of foreshadowing of these categories, right? Um, which was hitherto the most radical revolution. So, you know, you could say that someone like Milton was a left-wing writer, would have some meaning in a way that it wouldn't make sense to talk about Shakespeare or Dante in those categories, I think. Um, but the, the, the limitations of the, the, the British Revolution are, in some ways, it's a precocious revolution. I don't want to talk about that, take us off track. In some ways, it's a precocious revolution. There were actually two revolutions, a precocious revolution. But in other ways, it's also a relatively limited revolution. In other words, it's not something that, that acquired any universal significance. It happened basically and affected a couple of islands. And the rest of Europe and the world kind of went on blissfully unaware. Um, the French Revolution is obviously different. Okay? It certainly affected all of Europe. Um, it also changed the way people fundamentally thought about it. Um, you know, to a large extent, the British Revolution was still speaking in a kind of quasi-religious language. The French Revolution, you find a language that I mean, that in certain respects comes to seem very much like a language that one would encounter in the present, right? There's a, there's a kind of secularism, there's a universalism. Uh, uh, many of the, the themes that, you know, we were talking about now, all of these are present. You know, feminism, uh, anti-racism, they all are in some way present, internationalism in the problems posed by the French Revolution. Um, and there's a danger in that, right? And the danger in that is sort of anticipating the present. Um, in a little while, we'll get to someone named Babeuf, uh, who was a, a radical of the 1790s, and something called the cons Conspiration des Egaux, which was a conspiracy for equality. Am I talking too fast? No. Um, and you know, this has been seen, and it's a kind of complicated historical problem, as a kind of anticipation of revolutionary communism, right? That he's sort of the first revolutionary communist. And, and, there's a, and a lot of people in the Marxist tradition have seen that. So, but, 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 and when you look at it, it's sort of like a, a sort of Janus figure. But, but what, what's interesting is that you can see him that way, right? You can see this figure who speaks a language that one can sort of see the 20th century reflected. Um, and now I, I want to go back and speak about like, like the other aspect of the French Revolution is that, that it happened, right? Um, and that it was an event of universal significance. And also of this phrase, the bourgeois revolution. So starting almost from the beginning when it happened, the French Revolution seemed a tremendously important event. And people at the time saw it as, as marking an epoch in history. Um, and from very early on, and it was not by Marxists, the idea that the one aspect of the significance of the French Revolution was that it was the bourgeoisie had taken power, right? This interpretation of the idea of a bourgeois revolution. And this is a revolution, this is a notion put forward by bourgeois historians, bourgeois liberal historians of the early 19th century. It's later taken up um, by, by uh, more radical historians. We can talk about the history of the historiography. Um, and it's definitely taken up by Marxism. And it's a notion that was kind of common sense until about a generation ago. Right? It was not something that anybody thought to question. Um, and increasingly, uh, you, you, the first signs of summoning Alfred Cobbin in the 1950s, 
you have a rejection of that notion. Okay, and the ideological character of that rejection is definitely connected to a rejection of Marxism. So, one of the problems with discussing the French Revolution, particularly at this late date, and this goes back to Arno Meyer's comment, is the thinking about the French Revolution is now inextricably tied to thinking about the Russian Revolution. Um, that the two revolutions have have kind of fused in terms of like how one thinks about them, how one interprets them, right? And and it, they they fuse um, at many levels, right? And and this fusion goes back um, to uh, very early on. Um, it happens to be the case. I mean, I I turned recently. I wasn't aware of this, but but the probably the the people who most were aware of studying the outside of France, the, the, the French Revolution, were Russians, right? The, the, the knowledge of the, the French Revolution was very, very widespread in late 19th century Russia among the intelligence. Not just radicals, but liberals all across the board. People were obsessed with the French Revolution. So, you know, when Lenin and Trotsky talk about the French Revolution, believe me, they had read the, you know, Lenin had clearly read Olar and then Matthias' criticism, and they, they knew this, and they, in a sense, mentally lived in this space of thinking about the French Revolution. And there's a comment of... Um, Wasn't it in part because they were obsessed with French culture more generally? They were obsessed with French culture, but they saw a parallel right, right. with their own still autocratic society and and um, and Russia. And um, so, you know, again, we'll, 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 I, I'll get back to that because, so, you know, when Trotsky comes and can talk about Thermidor, right? Well, Trotsky was, you know, it's kind of like when Marx talks about classroom, right? That was something completely in the air among Russian intellectuals, right? You know, there's this scene during the Civil War where Marina Tsvetaev is a, 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 a Russian poet, and she's like, you know, with these exiles, or the, and they're like reading Pierre's like history of the, the French Revolution and like foreseeing the future of like the Russian Revolution. And you know, you have like, like you know, some left SR wants to, to condemn the the Bolshevik says they're not Jacobins because Russia is a flat country and it can't produce a Montagne. Montagne, right? This, so, 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 and and the reason I mention this obviously because we're Platypus 1917 and our focus is on the problem of Marxism is that I want to emphasize how inextricably tied these two problems are in terms of historical memory, right? <clears throat> And you know, I had a conversation with James when I was thinking about this, and he said, you know, I, and James said, we, he felt that all of the historiography of you know, the, the French Revolution was sort of irreparably damaged by sort of the knowledge of the later event, which, which I agree with, right? I actually think that's a, a true statement, but I think it leaves us with a problem, because I think that we are unable to think about the French Revolution now without thinking about, at some level, the problem of the Bolshevik Revolution, which would not, of course, been true in the 19th century, right? And that often leads to a problem of misrecognition, because the world of the French Revolution, and we'll get into that, was a very different world, right? Um, and certain aspects of social reality had not developed, right? You didn't really have, you didn't have an industrial proletariat at the time of the French Revolution. It, it's a different class structure. Um, so, okay, I, I'm not sure like how much sort of actual empirical knowledge people have about the French Revolution. So I'm sort of going to assume that people don't really know that much about it and sort of begin by telling a little bit of the story about the French Revolution. So, um, the first background to the French Revolution is, um, it's actually really, in a way, the first world war. Okay, it was the first 
war that was fought on the global scale. So the conventional answer is the Seven Years' War. Sometimes in, in American history, it's known as the French and Indian War, but it's really all the same thing. Um, the war took place on, in involved battles and struggles on several continents, in Europe, uh, mostly Central Europe, in North America, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, or battles and struggles over Africa, the Caribbean, etc. Um, it didn't involve the Far East, but a large portion of the people who live on the planet today have histories that have, were directly affected by it. Right? The fact that India became British, basically, um, is due to the Seven Years' War. The fact that, that you know, uh, the British conquered Canada, and then later there was the, a, an American Revolution. All of these events, the rise of Prussia, etc. Uh, the, 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 the war, you know, wasn't devastating on like a, a World War I or II scale, but it did have these profound events, and it was to some extent a reprise of an earlier conflict uh, that had been fought in the 1740s. France was defeated, right? It was basically a duel for global trade supremacy between France and Britain. France had a much larger population, but in many ways, England was the more socially advanced and had a bigger navy. Um, France, in this war, was allied with Austria and Britain with Prussia. Um, the, and um, the, that was a reversal of the earlier alliances. Um, the consequence of the Seven Years' War, uh, among the consequences, were a profound financial crisis. In, in, uh, in France, also some in Britain too, but particularly in France. And um, the, this, this um, okay, and, and this led to attempts to, to, to beef up revenue, right? So the, one of the things that the initial uh, impulse that provoked the, the, the series of events that led to the French Revolution was basically a problem of, of taxation. Um, and so to understand this, you have to understand, um, I guess, a little bit about um, the ancien regime. So, um, you know, we're used to the idea of um, uh, you know, the idea theoretically is people who make more money, people at the top of the society should pay more in taxes. That would be a normal conception, right? Basically, the aristocracy, the people who dominated French society, were exempt from taxes, right? So the, it was like the idea was that the people who are the most downtrodden have to pay the most taxes. But there's a limit to that, right? You can only crush people so much and get so much money. And so there was a need to tax the possessing classes. Now, the, the rule of you know, 18th century society um, was this idea of like enlightened despotism. And Britain is an exception to this, uh, the Netherlands. But, but now, despite the fact that you had this notion of an absolute monarchy, right? the truth was the monarchy was not really absolute. Right? The, the monarchy could be held up in all sorts of ways by these uh, bodies called parliament, right? which in some ways represented civil society, in other ways were basically reactions. These were not elected bodies. Uh, they were kind of judicial courts, private corporations, office was bought in them. It, it's, it's a very complicated system, and there are many different ones, and there were internal tabs. I, I, we, we can't spend too much time. <laughs> On, on all of the details. Um, so It was a very heterogeneous state. It was a very heterogeneous state. And it was a state where different laws applied in different places. There were internal customs. Different um, laws applied to different castes. Different, well, yes. So, but, so both geographically and in terms of caste or class, there were a whole series of different laws that applied. So um, one impulse of the, the, the monarchy was to try to, to suppress the parliaments, right? And in the last years of Louis XV, 
who's the, the grandfather of the last king. So in the early 1770s, there was a man who was basically a, a prime minister, Mopu, who um, tried to suppress the parliament. I mean, he even like, arrested these people. He did all sorts of like, fairly intense things to crush the parliaments, right? And he succeeded for a few years, but then the, the inertia of this, the system fought back. And when the king died and, and Louis, Louis the, the, the 16th came to power, it, all the work was undone. Um, and so what you had was a kind of um, standoff. And then two other um, points that should be mentioned. So. Um, in 1776, a man named Turgot, who should uh, also be familiar because he was uh, one of the founders of the physicrats, he was a student of King Edward, which was one of the sort of early school of, of bourgeois economics, was dismissed, and someone named Necker, who was a Swiss banker, was brought in, who would come back later. Um, Necker also has a, an interesting relationship. So uh, his wife, was the woman that Gibbon was in love with. And she was, in turn, the mother of Madame de Stahl, who was Benjamin Constant's friend and sometime mother. The whole family um, And so uh, Negger was brought in, uh, and then he was dismissed uh, after a few years. And um, Negger would be brought back um, in, in 1780. And then dismissed him. And that was sort of the trigger for what led to the storm of Bastille. Um, so, but he had a, a, a good popular reputation, whether it was deserved or not. Um, anyway, sort of skipping a few years, the, the, the other thing that happened was that, that because of, I mean, people are, I suppose, familiar here with the American Revolution. Um, and of course, one of the reasons the Americans were able to win their independence was because of French military aid. Yeah, financially. Financial and military aid, right? And um, in fact, Lafayette, who was the, the famous Lafayette who helped the Americans, who also played a, a, a significant role in the French Revolution on the sort of moderate end of it. Um, and that also further strained French finances. Now, uh, something has to be borne in mind is that, you know, Ancien regime states that the overwhelming uh, uh, the majority of the budget went to the cost of the military. I mean, basically, like, you know, we think of the state as having all sorts of purposes, right? Social welfare, education, uh, whatever. Okay, the, the French state of the 18th century didn't do any of those things, right? It didn't care about educating people or providing structure. They didn't, well, yeah, there was some infrastructure. There was a, there was a point, I should say. There was some attempt to build infrastructure. But, but basically, the purpose of these states was to extract as much revenue from the downtrodden peasantry and sort of become as militarily efficient and conquer more territory from other states that were in competition, right? And uh, if enough taxes couldn't be raised, raised to pay for the military budget, the state would borrow from bankers and financiers. And you didn't even have a system of direct ta taxation. You had systems of tax farmers who got a, 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 a cut, a cut of, the of the taxes they raised, right? So again, this is, this is the, the system that is in trouble. Now, um, so someone named Calon finally uh, said, OK, we give up. We can't beat the parliaments. We're going to bring back this institution called the Estates General. Um, now, the last time the Estates General, this was in 1789, I guess the call was 1789. The last time the, the Estates General had been called was in 1614. Um, and the. Uh, Interesting, one of the people who, who sat in the, the last time was Richelieu, who later became prime minister of the, the beginning of the absolutist monarchy. Um, and the, the Estates General had been a, a kind of late medieval institution. Uh, it came into existence around the end of the 13th, beginning of the 14th century. 
uh, it has gone through various ups and downs. Um, it, it had not developed, and, and again, this would take us as far afield, so there hadn't been the same social development of sort of a parliament that there had been in Britain. Um, and uh, there, so, so basically what happened, I guess you could say, okay. Well, they called the estates general because of the financial crisis. They called the estates general, but I'm trying to give it a sense of like, like a little <laughs> bit of the background. So, so one of the narratives that you, you hear, right, is the, the French Revolution was an anti-feudal revolution, right? So the bourgeois revolution against feudalism, right? Now, a lot of people, particularly in recent decades, have said, well, you know, that's nonsense. There really was hardly any feudalism at all. I mean, there were some serfs and, you know, particularly in the East, but, but mostly there weren't many serfs. There were um, feudal dues and rights that were, that were a kind of the privileges that the aristocracy as a caste had that it could extract. It was a kind of um, caste privilege. But if one thinks about feudalism in terms of like the 12th and 13th centuries, right, <coughs> that society was actually long gone, right? And, and so when you're thinking about like the transition from feudalism to bourgeois society, something like this happened. Right there's the rise of feudalism in the in, in sort of the, the early Central Middle Ages. The system then starts breaking down after the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, in France, particularly, sort of the period from say about 1540 to, to 1640, there's a kind of crisis of the aristocracy. The religious civil wars. Um, the upshot of this period of disturbance, which then culminates with a, with a kind of aristocratic reaction around the 1640s of the Fronde between Louis XIII and Louis XIV, is the, the absolute monarchy of Louis XIV, right? So starting in the late 16th century and then building up through this, the, the 17th, culminating with Louis XIV, you have this, this bureaucratic absolutist state. And the bureaucratic absolutist state is in a sense a rationalizing bourgeois state itself, right? It's, 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 it's actually a state that is supported by the bourgeoisie in disciplining and controlling this feudal anarchy. Are people getting this idea? Or any questions? The feudal anarchy that um, would have been signaled Precisely, maybe less in France than in Germany, but precisely by the Protestant Reformation and the religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. That that divides the aristocracy, it creates a different kind of tension between the aristocracy and the common people. It's sort of all bound up in that. When do they expel the Huguenots? Well, that's 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 later in 1685. Yeah, so that's also 17th century. It's a kind of a late development, but it's a kind of yeah. Those those are the French Protestants. Right. Um. Okay, so 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 in the so when one says okay when you're looking at the state that is developed in the 17th century and then the 18th century we're looking at these the at the Louis the Louis 13th 14th particularly 14th 15th and 16th you're looking at a state that is becoming in certain ways progressively bourgeois but also has this sort of aristocratic cast there, right? Um, so, and, and, and one of the, the, the aspects, and this gets back to the point about the Revolt Nobiliere, is because this, this caste, right? So, so originally, if you think about the rise of feudal aristocracy, the feudal aristocracy are the people who fight, right? You know, it's the people who fight, the people who pray, and the people who work, right? But obviously, you know, in France of the 18th century, um, the nobility, unless they were part of the army, and the army was dominated by the nobility, they weren't, like, like really fighting, right? So the nobility becomes this sort of idle, begins to be seen as sort of an idle parasitic caste. It no longer has its own social 
justification, the higher nobility increasingly lives in Versailles. The lower nobility often is sinking into poverty, right? And often when these people are sinking into poverty, their response is, well, the only thing I have going, you know, it's like a poor white mentality, it's like the poor noble mentality. The only thing I have going for me is that I'm, I'm of noble blood. Is that I'm noble blood, and you know, there are still these feudal privileges. And right? therefore the state should give me money. Right. And 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 but these feudal privileges that I can use to extract um, something from the peasantry. Or um, certain offices should be reserved in. Right, you know, including professorships. Yeah, or I mean, so I mean, it, it again, it's not a racial distinction, but in a certain sense, it's it's a it's a, it's a question of caste privilege, right? So the so what is happening is that the, the in some ways the caste privilege is hardening at the same time that people under the influence of the Enlightenment, a large section of society, is seeing this as increasingly unreasonable. Um, and because of this, this kind of political financial deadlock, the, the first thing that happens is this kind of notion of a revolt noble year, which is a, a kind of resistance of the nobility to the reforming impulses of the absolutist monarchy. There's this calling of the Estates General. And the last time the Estates General had met was 175 years ago, and they had voted by estates. But by this time, the third estate, um, which is actually joined by some liberal members from the first and second estates, decides that it really is the nation, that all the estates should meet together in a, in a national assembly. This is at first resisted, and at one point the, there's, the, the, there's the famous episode of the, the tennis court of where the third estate gets locked out of the room they're meeting, they go to the, a neighboring tennis court, uh, and they meet inside the tennis court, in the tennis court, and they swear a famous oath, saying that they're not going to leave till the, 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 the government backs down. And um, uh, there's also the dismissal of Becker. Anyway, anyway, the, 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 um, the result of this is um, speed up a bit. Uh, so the result of this is that um, under the, the process of opening up the political process, suddenly huge segment of society gets politicized. And um, the Development that happens is there's a radicalization. So instead of like, like it just becoming a financial question, it becomes a general, broader political question of, of, of democracy. And you have a move towards what's a constitutional one, right? So uh, the king is, a, you know, brought this, the storming of the Bastille, uh, uh, the king is brought back to uh, Paris to the Tuileries instead of Versailles. Uh, there's the, um, oh yes, the other thing that happens is that there's a, that as a result of these, there's a huge kind of rural turmoil in 1799. So it's called the Grand Pour, the Great Fear. And there's a, there is in, on August 4th, there's a, an abolition of feudal dues, right? So there's a, there's a speeding up of the process of the revolution, and um, a um, an increasing participation of society. Um, you don't have what we would consider political parties, but you have these political clubs, right? Um, one of the the famous clubs originally started by a group of Breton deputies, um, for certain reasons why the Breton are more radical. Um, then calls itself Société des Amis de la Constitution, better known because of the, the convent they met in the, the Jacobin Club, and there are others. And um, we'll talk about that later. So, okay, so going, going through these stages, and these stages are based upon a, a classic a historian in Kiev. I was going to read through this whole list, I, I Xerox the list. 
something really special. It's like an effect to it. So one way of thinking about this and like the events that happen are through these stages. And we don't have to think about the details. So from 1789 to 1792, right, there is the a kind of bourgeois revolution. There's a constitution in 1791, it creates a constitutional monarchy. Um, one, of the, one of the things that happens in, um, in this process of differentiation, right? So if you want to think about it sort of um, on a scale of left to right, okay? So, Um, sort of here on the right, you have emigres, counter-revolutionaries, right? These are the people who think the whole thing is a disaster uh, and just want to return to the old order. Um, then sort of you have the constitutional monarchists um, who, who want something sort of more like Britain. Um, and uh, you know, and then there are uh, a people who will later be called the Girondins, which is a somewhat confusing term, um, which I'll explain. And then, hold on. Okay, so this is moving further to the left, right? And then <laughs> you have sort of the the, the Jacobins, who themselves later get get politically. Um, uh, Split up. Uh, this is there's a club called the Club des Foyons, which is associated with constitutional monarchists. Um, the Girondins, by the way, since we're used to the idea of opposing Girondins to the Jacobins, the Girondins actually begin as Jacobins, right? In fact, a lot of the people in the Club des Foyons also begin as Jacobins. So there's a there's a splitting of this democratic impulse and people saying, no, no, you're going too far, right? And there's this constant dynamic of things getting further. Now. One of the things that happens is that the revolution goes to war. Um, and it goes to war uh, first with, against Austria and Prussia, and later it gets involved with fighting uh, Holland and, and Britain. Now, since the analogy, of course, of the Russian Revolution, something has to be pointed out here. Um, the, the Girondins were the war party. The Jacobins were the anti-war anti party. Or more correctly, Robespierre was the anti-war party. <laughs> okay, because some of the Jacobins went. Um, Robespierre's attitude was simple. His attitude was that um, a war would, that the French army was unprepared, uh, that Economy was still screwed. That yeah, the, the economy and and that the, the fear that that it was make authoritarian that it would make an authoritarian impulse if you have a general who would take over, you know, a kind of anticipation of the Yeah. So um, against the war on and, liberal grounds. And the other thing is, unlike again, like the case of the, the Russian Revolution, um, it wasn't there was a kind of war of choice aspect to this, right? In other words, it was not. Um, it was not clear, right, that the Austrians and the Prussians were raring to invade France. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for this. One is they were still working on dividing up Poland, and the other thing is that uh, they had their own fear because of the limitations of national regime society, right, that of sort of pushing their subjects into something that they feared would radicalize them, right. So they, you know, they, there was a declaration from Franz Josef saying, you know, don't you dare, you know, touch touch the king, and you know he needs to be free to go where he is. But but the, the war, anyway, the war breaks out. Um, basically, it's a it's a war of choice. Um, the other thing you have to understand geographically is um, that that so so both Prussia and Austria had territory directly bordering France, right? So, so Belgium at this point is the Austrian Netherlands, right? It's, it's, it's ruled by Austria previously. 
Belgium was the part of the Netherlands that remained under Spanish Habsburg control. Then it got passed to the Austrians. And there's actually a revolution, a, a somewhat different revolution, in Belgium in 1789, which leads to something called the United States. It was somewhat different from the, the, the French Revolution, but anyway, it was crushed by Austrian troops. And later, the French invade, they annex Belgium. Anyway, but that, that's a, a side. So, um, at, contrary to what the Girondins expect, also the, the king is kind of... Marie Antoinette is Austrian. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I have Marie Antoinette is Austrian, and her brother and her is, brother the, is the emperor of Austria. And so, of course, there's <laughs> always the question of, can I get my brother to come rescue us? Right, exactly. And there's paranoia within the country, that within France, that, that this is going to happen, even though he's actually delaying it. There, there's paranoia. There's talk about plot, but, 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 but the the big picture here is that that the war is opposed by the most left wing elements. If you want to draw a left wing, a left and right wing. So the war is pushed by sort of the moderate left. It's opposed by the extreme left. And uh, it's also pushed by the monarchy. So as I guess say, the king also wanted the war. The king also wants because the war. he thinks that it will undermine the revolution. Hmm? What's the what? War aim. The war aim is to make you know, Europe safe for the revolution. Make Europe safe for the revolution. I mean, that's one of the things. It's not clear what the war aims are. The war aims are expandable. You know. I mean, uh, it's fair so to say it's Europe is on the verge of war on its own. It's basically about to go to war. There's already right. like sort of like this like between Austria, Prussia, and Russia trying to you know divide Poland and like the British. Like there's there's already this atmosphere of war, where the French Revolution represents to most people, uh, to most monarchs, uh, the exclusion of France, the temporary exclusion of France from politics. Um, yeah, know, that's that's fair to say. So so I mean. I mean, they're, they're essentially, I mean, if you look at it from a geopolitical, there are like two spheres that are working here. There's an Eastern sphere in Eastern Europe, which is centered around Polish events at the moment, and there's a Western sphere centered around France and neighboring territory. So, and there's the sense of monarchical solidarity, and there's a sense of revolutionary solidarity. There are also, by the way, are small, generally small minorities of people in all of these neighboring countries. Um, who are very sympathetic to the French Revolution, right? You call them, the, like in modern terms, you know, it would be like, like when the Russian Revolution came, where people were like, oh, that's great, you know, who are Bolsheviks, right? You know, similarly, there are British Jacobins. There are British Jacobins. There are a lot of Italian Jacobins. Is it Sardinia? That's what I remember reading. Bits. Sardinia had like a revolution. There, well, there was, I mean, later on, there was a republic. Not, not in 1792. Well, not 1792, yeah. Later. But later on. Um, the Italy is a place of struggle. Right. Or, to, or to put it more accurately, what I would say is that in places like Italy, there are a lot of left-wing intellectuals who are sympathetic, or places like Germany, right? So there are left-wing intellectuals in all of these countries who are sympathetic. These people on their own would probably not have presented much threat to the authorities. But backed by French armies, of course, that was a different story. Um, so the, the, the battles, right, one of the things that happens um, is that um, the, um, the the battles go badly right? for, the for the French at first, right? In fact, the, one of the leading French generals, defects, uh, Du Maurier, he's kind of the, the Benedict Arnold. Um, <laughs> and in, interestingly, one of the people who's a colonel in his forces later becomes Louis Philippe, right? The, the king after 1830. So the effect of this is to um, lead to a, a radicalization of the, the revolution, right? The, the king had already earlier attempted to escape 
and then brought back the royal family, uh, the, the famous uh, flight to Bahrain, and they've been brought, they've been stopped, and they kind of were prisoners. Um, there is a kind of second revolution, um, which is uh, really the beginning of, of the, the, the French Republic, which is on August 10, 1792. And there's a storming by the, the local National Guard at the, the Tuileries Palace. And the, I mean, the other thing you have to remember is that, that Paris is always in the vanguard of these revolutions. It's much more radical than the rest of the country. And in fact, other parts of the country, right, are actually start to rebel against Parisian dominance, right? So the, the rest of, of France is much more um, conservative. And there are, there's a, there are guerrilla insurrections that begin. And, and throughout the next few years, there are uh, revolts, particularly in the West and South. The, the Vendée is the, the most famous, uh, but there were also revolts in the Midi, there was in Brittany, the Chouannerie, and so forth. Um, so this is the, the revolution that, again, that Mathieu, one of the classic, calls the, uh, uh, the uh, democratic and revolutionary revolt, right? In other words, instead of the ideal of the constitutional monarchy, you have the Republic. This is the French Republic at war with the monarchs. And um, it's important to realize that the Girondins represent a democratic impulse, right? It's not that the Girondins are just right wing, right? It, they, they represent, let's say, the more moderate aspect of the democratic republic. There is a, in particularly in the, then afterward, um, um, so, okay, let me think. I have to hurry up, sorry. Um, so, one, one of the things that happens um, right after this is, for example, there's a, the Parisian mob, which feels threatened by foreign armies, breaks into the prisons and massacres, the famous family massacres. Um, and uh, then, who are the prisoners that they massacred? They massacred all sorts of people. They, but who are they really going after? Though they're going after these sort of. Uh, they they saw these prisoners as uh, counter revolutionaries. As counter revolutionaries, right? And so, the the reason I mention that is that that this is an embarrassing moment for the the left wing. Right? There there's a sense of something has gone wrong. And later, in fact, when you have the, the terror, right, the official terror of the Revolutionary Tribunals, one of the motives for it is the idea of avoiding sort of episodes of popular justice, right? At least this is sort of the state, right? Um, so anyway, um, in the process of the, the, the wars going bad, uh, then there's, the, there's a, a, a second or a third revolution where the Girondins are essentially forced to be kicked out of the, the National Assembly by a mob. Uh, this is after the Girondins are, are kicked out. Um, there, a, a, a system is set up where you have something called the, the Committee of Public Safety. And this is where the Jacobins, who represent the most radical wing hitherto of the, the sort of bourgeois Republican narrative become dominant, particularly under the leadership of Rosie. Um, and this is the, the most radical phase, the 1793 to 1794 period of the French Revolution. Um, the Committee of Public Safety, it's a collective executive body. It's a collective executive body. It's a subset of the assembly that, um, that exercises executive authority. Right, <clears throat> but which is, the, which is, which is um, subordinate, I mean, which can be recalled by, by, the, uh, by the assembly. In other words, it's, it, it's kind of like our organ, right? You know, it's like, <laughs> like the, the membership or the, the, the national assembly votes these people 
right? <laughs> to to manage things, to you know, to do things that the assembly as a whole cannot do, right? So it's it's still within the framework of a uh, parliamentary and democratic uh, arrangement. There's also, I mean, the other thing is that there have been. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting old. So there had been a, a constitution in 1791, which was a kind of constitutional monarchy, moderate, you know, parliamentary. There's another constitution which is enacted in 1793, um, which is probably the most radically democratic constitution anywhere on the planet up to that moment. Right? It's based on universal male suffrage. Uh, it uh, no property qualifications. It's a democratic republic. Now, because there's a war, this constitution never goes into effect. So the attitude is, we're going to maintain this government of prices until we can have elections and have a democratic republic. Uh, there's later a constitution, I guess, in 1795, in the, the Thermidorian period, which undoes that, and there's some others. But um, this, So when people spoke about the principles of 93, right, this is what they were talking about. The most radical republic. Now, in the context of the radicals, right, the the the, the non-radicals or the the the, the center left had by now been excluded. But so within the context of the Jacobins and the Assembly in the period of uh, 1793 to 1794, um, you have, and I'll, I'll put it again on a on a left right scale, right? So you have Danton, then you have Robespierre. I'm being very schematic, I hope, but I'm trying to summarize a lot. Um, and then you have, well, yeah. was like, so then you have Hebert and um, Marat. And then, okay, Going um, further to the left, you have people like Jacques Roux and the Enragé. Okay, the, these people are not in the government. They represent kind of the plebeian masses. Jacques Roux is a defrocked priest. Enrage means like enraged, but it also means crazy. In the Marat Saad play, the Jacques Roux character appears in a straight jacket, screaming. Um, so the 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 basic like, but the but the reason these people are significant is that they put pressure, right? That they put pressure on people to their right. Do you have a question? Oh yeah, this this is going. To the right is actually the left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, right? He's just using his, his left. As I'm his, using, yeah. right. Okay, so so this is sort of called the right, right? This is the more the more moderate, the indulgence. So, so, um, so these are terms that are actually used at that moment, right? Left oh, right. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, left and, in fact, it's the, the origin of it is just a few years early. I mean, I don't know if they were used I think it's only used in the Jura map, right? Then, I'm not. I'm not. You know, there's, I'm a little bit uncertain of like like how common they were, but but the the idea of left and right actually comes from the original sitting uh, in the, the first National Assembly, right? But 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 the basic concept, right? Um, and and again, like like calling it left and right, I'm I'm giving a kind of schematic view. I mean, people would argue about that. And who is the good guy in all of these? It's like a very complicated debate within left-wing scholarship, right? So, you know, for Olar, you know, Danton was the hero. If you read Derek Buchner, Danton is the hero. Robespierre is the bad guy. You know, Mathieu and other people, Robespierre is the bad, the, 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 the great Robespierre. Um, there are even a few people support. So Marat, by the way, is the one who gets assassinated by Charlotte Corday in uh, 1790, I forget the month. And uh, who was a, a Girondin supporter, and sort of Hebert stays still in. Um, so, okay. So the question is, how does one understand? Yeah, sorry, I just a quick question. Are you, are you 
talking about the National Assembly as wondering a bit about the role of the Paris Commune itself, sort of Parisian. Oh, uh, okay, so when the Paris Commune. Who is one of those, like, you know, radical, it was pushing them? Right, so so one of the things, right, so there's this National Assembly, right, that represents the, the nation. Now, Paris itself it, it has, like, the, the Paris city government gets even more radical, right? So the, the, the actual government of Paris, right, which is divided into these 48 sections, is, is actually pushing, in a way, the national government to the left, right, and activists in that. And, and, you know, again, it's not like sort of the modern nation state, right? You know, it took weeks to get from one end of the country to the other. So the local activity of, of plebeian mobs, right, and, and what was happening in Paris uh, profoundly affected political development. I mean, basically, the moderate forces up until 1794 lost out in Paris, right? And they lost out because basically, the sans culotte, the, the, the plebeian masses, supported the Japanese, right? But these were the people they trusted. Um, and and the, the... So they could always be used as shock troops against So the they could be used as shock troops. Now, there are different interpretations. And, and if you look at sort of the, the, the left-wing historiography, so there's a, a guy named Daniel Guerin who was actually a Trotskyist for a while and became a, a kind of anarchist. And in his interpretation, right, and, and really it turns in the interpretation of Robespierre and the Jacobins, right? So his interpretation is that, that Robespierre and the Jacobins were also interested in suppressing the popular forces, right? That they were carried away by them, but fundamentally they were the enemy of the the, the masses, right? The spontaneous activity of the masses. Um, that's not the traditional, it's not the interpretation of Marx or Lenin or Trotsky, right? The, the interpretation of Marx, Lenin, and Trotsky, and the dominant sort of Marxist interpretation has been to see sort of Robespierre as a hero. Other left-wing interpretations would sometimes see Danton as the hero. There's a very strange book that just came out by Jonathan Israel, the historian of the, uh, you know, the enlightenment. enlightenment, and called Revolutionary Ideas, and he basically wants to revive Brisson and uh, Girondin, and he's like, oh, the Bolsheviks were these authoritarian nationalists, whatever. right? Um, I'm giving you more or less a traditional leftist interpretation, which is not particularly any one historian, but it's a little bit of Sobu, a little bit of around a little bit of different people. Um, I don't want to go too long, but, but okay. So would you just to get to the Thermidor question. So one, one point that should also be mentioned about Thermidor um, is that the movement that actually brings down Robespierre is that Robes, it's actually an alliance between the left and the right, right? So Robespierre and the Jacobins at first attacked the, the Hébertis and the Dantonis, the, and, um, but, but, the, but Thermidor then becomes a kind of move in reverse in which people, uh, both the, the left and the right, attack Robespierre and bring him down, right? It's the, it's the sense that the terror has run out of control and that it can just consume everyone. And, the other thing is that the, the terror is accelerating, right? So the last two months are the blend. The guillotine is intensifying. And what you have is the, this sort of this machine that, that, you know, nobody knows exactly what's going on. You know, anyway, but we don't want to have to get it. And uh, the reason I mentioned this question of an alliance of sort of left and right against the center is that it's ironic if you think about Trotsky's analogy uh, to Thermidor in terms of Stalin. Because in terms of what happened in the Soviet Union, of course, it's the center that, that attacked both the left and the right, right? In the, in the formulation of left, right, and center. Um, and all of which may show that the problem cannot be conceived in these terms, 
in either case, but I'm just throwing that out. Um, I'm a little concerned about time here. Uh, so, um, okay, the, the period of Thermidor is also a, um, a kind of confusing period. Again, the, the, the first period after Thermidor uh, is not immediately a period of a move to the right. In some ways, it's a period of apparent liberalization from the terror. Uh, so, you, you know, you have someone like Babouf who had been imprisoned under the terror and thinks, well, this is a good thing, the terror has ended. But then the, the dynamic moves steadily to the right. Um, there are some attempts, uh, where's the date of these? What are the class dynamics of that? Well, so in my understanding, I basically just based on my reference of world that basically the removal of Robespierre is a move to the right and that it's kind of like big property holders. Um, yeah, except that, that that's not, I mean, I mean, yes, that's, those are the people who benefit, but really what you have in the, the period of, uh, of Thermidor is a kind of balance, right? You see like attacking to the right and attacking to the left. Um, so uh, you see this around Babouf, who's let out of prison. You see that there's a lot of sympathy for him. Uh, where's the, the date here? Um, in 1795, so you have, okay, the date is here. December 24th, 1794, the maximum, maximum price controls is abolished. Um, on April 1st, you have the, in 1795, you have the popular uprising of the 12th of Germinal. Then you have May 20th, the popular uprising of the 1st of Curial. And these were uprisings from the left. These were kind of Jacobin resistance to the rule of the directory. On the constitution of the year three, that's the third constitution I mentioned, 1795, it's a conservative constitution, is put in power. Um, but then, like a couple of years later, okay, September 4, 1797, you have the coup d'etat of Fructidor. So what that is, is the opposite. Okay, you have these elections, and the right wing basically is winning the elections, the runs, right? And then you have, uh, I don't know, where is the, the, the date I think it was in the one, oh yeah, the, um, in 1795, October 5th, again, um, after uh, you have the uh, royalist uprising of the 13th of London. So essentially what the directory does is it crushes the Jacobins, and that's the struggle for the people to the left. But then the directory itself finds itself under attack from the left, right? And uh, ultimately this instability of trying to figure out the left and the right leads to Napoleon, who becomes the hero who will save it and establish a kind of rational and proportional state. Um, we have time? We have, I'm, I'm not sure how to, to, to go on. So, yeah. Okay. Wednesday during the reading group, we were trying to like locate uh, Napoleon like in the political spectrum. So in my understanding is he kind of emerges sort of out of the left. He like he thinks of himself as a Jacobin. Is that correct? Yeah, so he is a Jacobin. He is a Jacobin. I mean, Napoleon isn't like so much a political actor. He's sort of. Uh, I mean, first of all, you have to remember he's pretty young, right? So he's born I think in 1769, 70. So he's like not you know 1920 when 89 happens, right? And he, you know, goes to his military career. I mean. You know, he makes his uh, name in London Air, you know, as uh, the suppressor of a royalist uprising. I don't remember when he was promoted to the rank of general, but you know, it's in his in the twenties by the Jacobin government, right? Uh, I think it was in '93. But it, I mean, so he starts under the Jacobins, and he's sort of a kind of career soldier, a man of the world, who serves first with the Jacobin Army of the Republic, and then the the direct. Right? But he, he himself doesn't like really become political until his sort of military reputation makes him a candidate for this kind of historical role. Um, so, okay, what I was going to say. So, I mean, the other aspect, of course, of this period that has to be mentioned is um, the is Babu, right? Um, 
And Babeuf is kind of this fascinating contradictory figure, right? I mean, he, he's a Jacobin, definitely, a left Jacobin. Um, he's actually jailed under the terror of lots of people, but he, he's liberated by Thermidor. He, um, and he, he and he, he, there's a, you know, a, a plot basically for a kind of military uprising. Now, the, nothing comes of this. He's put in jail. He, he's eventually executed. Uh, later, through one of his accomplices, this, this passes into you know the revolutionary literature, um, and as a as a kind of heroic moment. Um, the the thing that that needs to be emphasized is the. I mean, in some ways, he's just the most. He's symptomatic of just this sort of frustration of Jacobins at the sort of failure of the revolution. Um, what's new, in a way, is the emphasis on the economic problem, right? That that in his, you know, kind of schematic way, he's a revolutionary communist, right? That that if you think of of sort of philosophy, you know. If Hegel is philosophy becoming historical, the French Revolution is sort of philosophy becoming political. And first in 1789, and then the Jacobins. And one aspect of that philosophy is the is the the idea of you know communism, right? Which has hitherto been you know a kind of ideal, right, of society, but a kind of religious or utopian ideal, and certainly nothing that sort of the Jacobin. Right again, like, like here you go, Mackay's distinction between sort of the Girondins and the Jacobins. Right, you could say that the that the Jacobins were for private property and sort of free trade, but sort of accepted that there would need to be restrictions on that for other reasons. For, right, um, but in in Babeuf you have like a radical break with that conception. Right, it isn't carried out. You have the idea that the state is going to take over basically everything, and you have these public granaries. And I mean, you know, you read that he even has this idea for a Republican one day, where you're going to take, they're going to take over some part of the country and have like a base camp. And you know, you read it, and you, know, you think about the 20th century, and you think like, oh, this is an 18th century Maoist, right? I mean, except of course that that the social conditions in the world were radically different, right? And again, and this again, you know, uh, brings I guess back to the original quotation of Karl Marx that I brought up about the the sort of significance of the French Revolution and its limitations. Um, one one obvious difference, two obvious differences about the world of the French Revolution. Sorry. One is that the French the world in which it took place was overwhelmingly rural and backward, right? It, it, it was a pre-industrial world, right? I mean, you had the big, very beginnings of this period of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, but you didn't really have it in France. Um, and the other is that, in a sense, all of this, all of these ideas were new, right? There was no, no um, way of Thinking through the 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 meaning, everything was being in a way tried for the first time, right? Um, and this goes back to again my point about politics. There's a way in which the 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 French Revolution invented the idea of revolution for the modern world, and up until the Russian Revolution, it was the revolution, right? That that in a sense determined the limits of politics. Um, and so, you know, the, the question about like, like what the French Revolution was necessary for, if you, you know, part of the weakness, I think, and maybe for us in Platypus, we don't need to think this, part of the weakness in some ways of the old, their interpretation for all of its virtues of it. The bourgeois revolution, getting rid of feudal barriers, creating this you know modern capitalism, 
is that one could say, well, you know, all of this stuff would have happened anyway, right? Or maybe it would have. You know, and then the idea that France became modern as a result of the French Revolution is kind of problematic. It's not clear that France in the, in the mid 19th century was more modern than Britain, which didn't have a revolution. Or, or that Germany became modern despite like, not having a revolution. So this question of like what modernity is. And yet, I mean, again, it's a counterfactual point. One has the feeling that without a French Revolution, you wouldn't have had modern politics. You wouldn't have had Marxism. You wouldn't have had anarchism. You wouldn't, that, that, that in that sense, the French Revolution was necessary for a Hegel, right? That the French Revolution opened up, like, thinking about experience and politics in ways that, if it hadn't happened, would have been impossible, right? So that, that the question of the necessity of the French Revolution, and I'm, to some extent, expressing my own perplexity here, you know, um, the necessity of the revolution isn't as clear, right? Just as the necessity of the Russian Revolution, or rather the necessity is of a different meaning, right? It's something that's needed rather than something that had to happen. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Just sort of. Um, how does, how does the terror in the lower sphere for the government kind of find its way? How does it begin and how does it kind of... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's how the terror like, that you were talking about like, arrives and how it takes its course. Um, okay, so, so France, uh, the... The, the Girondins are, are uh, driven out of the assembly because they have only jacketings of various types of the, the, the so called mountain, right? The left wing of the jacketings, but different variations. Uh, France is at war, there's a revolutionary tribunal. Um, again, like, there are many different terrors during the French Revolution. During the, the period of the Directory, there's a white terror, which kills a lot of people too. Uh, a lot of the terror is, uh, you know, people think of the guillotine in Paris, but probably some of the bloodiest episodes were, you know, you had cities that rebelled against the central government, and you had, the, you know, with Lyon, and you know, they sent in the army, and they crushed the insurgents, and, you know, there, there was terror to crush those people. So terror is like a, you know, covers many different forms of state oppression. Right? Some of which directed at like people who were in armed rebellion, and some of which was directed just at people who fell under <clears throat> suspicion. And I mean, you don't have to be a right wing and say it was very easy, you know, in 1793 or 1794 to fall under suspicion because someone denounced you. Uh, you know, th there was an atmosphere of paranoia. Right? It's also a kind of um, practical kind of breakdown of society. Um, and so a lot of what went on under the auspices of the terror was fighting against corruption. And what that meant was deputies of the assembly, um, you know, procuring resources for their friends um, in a state of extreme kind of rationing. And, uh, and you know, it's because the, the entire national economy was in a sense in crisis and had broken down. And so a lot of it has to do with um, bread rationing in yeah. Paris. And so the, the background to, to all of this is economic crisis and the need to feed people. Right? Yeah. And so Paris couldn't feed itself, so it had to you know, get food from the countryside. This provided a huge amount of you know, pressure for speculation, exploitation. You also black had, market so you also had a, for black paper, a paper currency that had been depreciated, right? And so part of the way that, that the economy kept functioning, you know, there, there was a saying uh, during the directory, right, 
that um, when the guillotine was running, we had bread, right? Which was just a sort of empirical observation. Like, okay, you know, maybe they were chopping people's heads off all the time, but my head wasn't being chopped off, and I had something to eat. And then they stopped chopping people's heads off, and, and it got worse. And it got worse, and it did. It got worse. Right? So that's the way. But the other thing that happened, and this is important to bear in mind, is some people said, well, when the king was in power, we had bread. Right? So, so that could, you know, lead to other forms of discontent. And often when and people were not in Paris, which was predominantly left wing, but in rural areas, the, the discontent uh, took a right wing form. It took from regionalism, uh, either moderate Girondin or counter revolutionary royalist. Um, and you know, also has to do with the church. The church, Richard has left the church completely out. I have left the but church. The church is the main institution of, uh, that's overthrown by the revolution. Right, and one of the issues, one of the central issues, I mean. And, and there's you. mass arresting of priests, mass right. so, so, of priests. So one of, I have left out. Set up the museum, the metric system in the like, cathedral. Right, so I have left out the problem of the church. So one of the first issues of the church is the subordination of the clergy to the national government, and they're supposed to swear an oath, right? And there was a non-jury, during non-swearing clergy, and, uh, you know, the persecution, the uh, oppression of these people. There's also the support given by, you know, the peasants to, uh, you know, the, the Catholic inspiration. There was the revolutionary calendar, where we had these 10-day weeks, which was meant to people so they wouldn't know what was the Saints Day. Oh, um, really? Yeah. yeah, that was the that was a large part. And but you know again these things are different. So one of the one of the complaints, right? So people said so one of the popular complaints was they said, you know, uh, oh we have a lot less holidays under this calendar than we did before. <laughs> yeah, because there are a million saint days. Because there are a million saints days. So it was also a, a, a method of kind of bourgeois <coughs> rationalization, right? You know, cut down all these non-working days and make people work hard, right? Um, and you know, priests, other, priests play an ambivalent role though because um, of course it's an illiterate society, which means that the literate people are disproportionately the clergy. And that means that the clergy can play a counter-revolutionary role as well as a revolutionary role like they're kind of politicized, they're put in this position especially in the countryside because they're the ones that the peasants have to turn to to find out what's going on. Um, it's and a, the third estate is also composed of a lot of priests. Yeah. Know. Well, I would. I only thing I was modified about that statement was the literate society in the countryside. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's what I mean. So, like the, the right, so vast population. Like the people I'm talking about here are the political actors. These are all They're yeah. lawyers. <laughs> yeah, the, these, the Jacobin Club is lawyers. Right. So if you look, for example, if you look at the sociological background of the Committee of Public Safety, so there's one noble, a road decision, who, by the way, is an Hébertiste, meaning a leftist, right, but who's denounced almost certainly falsely by this guy who's like corrupt and, you know, like, and he's like a noble. You know, he used to be a noble, right? <laughs> um, and the others are all like middle class people. One probably the lowest class person was an actor, right? You know, Robespierre was the lawyer. So you're talking about lawyers and you know people who were um, middle class, middle class, well read, intellectual. Um, even I mean the other thing that has that is you know I mentioned Hebert. So Hebert's popularity was based upon a newspaper called Le Père du Chien, right? And there was also a Mère du Chien, so and so. There are lots and lots of newspapers, right? And it was understood that Marat is basically providing popular support for Robespierre. Is that not true? Well, actually, Robespierre didn't like Marat. There was a definite like like rivalry, hostility. I mean, in fact, at one point, Robespierre had been closer to Danton. But um, when Marat was killed by Charles Ferguet, he turned him into a martyr. And they, he couldn't really say anything bad about Marat after that. But Robespierre was never like fond of Marat. They they had a I mean they didn't become enemies because he was, you know, but there was a definite tension between them. 
But I mean, the other issue about was there was a campaign of de-Christianization, yeah. right? And um, this was something that actually was pushed by the extreme left, and that Robespierre was against, right? You know, Robespierre had this famous line of, you know, atheism is aristocratic, right? The masses, you know, believe in that. true. Um, and um, and also, in the 18th century, and also, right? and also, you know, I mean, again, you think about it from a modern perspective. I mean, people said, "No, no, we're we're not we're not about banning Christianity because we believe in freedom of religion, right?" But of course, Christianity had a political goal. It wasn't just a religion, and it was the main inspiration of Catholic kind of religion first. And also, you also had the intervention. You know, we spoke about there were invasions from uh, again the Kingdom of Sardinia. The Spanish in the South, the British were in Toulon. Uh, you know, you had, uh, uh, you know, the domestic turmoil was there was the hope that it would be ended by the. There may be one way of thinking about this because Gregor brought up class struggle, is a kind of, you know, classic Leninist conception of revolution, which is that um, the system stops working and the masses can no longer live as they did before. And so what you have is a crisis of the absolute monarchy, and it takes a long time and goes through a, you know, a very tumultuous process of what could replace the old social and political and economic order, um, as well as the cultural order, because again, the church is the, is the highest institution in society in terms of actual social institutions. And there's also two revolutions, really. There's the Parisian Revolution, and there's the revolution in the countryside. Uh, in other words, the result of the breakdown of the absolute monarchy is different in the countryside than it is in the city. And one of the reasons why Marxists what? ever called it a bourgeois revolution is that it's an urban revolution in, in the way that they're looking at it, meaning that they're prioritizing the events that Richard went over with respect, and that, and that Sam brought up with respect to the disproportionate role that Paris plays in the reconstitution of society after the breakdown of the absolute monarchy. Because the absolute monarchy is a bourgeois state in a sense, um, in a sense of like an Adam Smith historiography, where the absolute monarch uses the bourgeoisie as a counterweight against the aristocracy. Um, that, and this is not only true in, in France, but it's, it's more generally a Western and Central European phenomenon, where the rise of absolute monarchical states is an alliance between a rising bourgeois class and the absolute monarchy against the traditional feudal aristocracy. And that's going on for hundreds of years before the revolutions. From a Marxist perspective, the revolution is the end of that process. In other words, it's the kind of final end of that process. But looked at another way, what I mentioned earlier was you could say, okay, well, the, the absolutist state could continue. In other words, the absolutist state has a contingent crisis due right. to the... Uh, but that contingent the British, crisis also allows the masses to enter the stage of history. Right. And, that's and where, that right. is what is of fundamental significance. That's right. And that's right. where it's a bourgeois revolution and also where it's a revolution of the peasants. It's, you know, it, yeah. I mean, the other thing, it's a, the other thing that needs to be borne in mind is that, that in a sense, that the world that the French Revolution aspired to create in 1793 in some ways was accomplished but in conservative terms many years. So in other words, you know by eighteen thirty, it's the you know, it, it it the the final kind of Or I was thinking thing. like like even if you think about it like in terms of the twentieth century. So I mean it's like like if you said, well France is now a bourgeois republic with universal suffrage, right? It's only after World War Two. Oh Okay, but 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 that that goal doesn't seem to us a radical goal, and there's a way in which like the ideal of politics set by core by the French Revolution is a kind of now a kind of naturalized universal goal, right? But that but that naturalization tends to obscure the radicalism of the initial one. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like you know like people say you know, as a, a perverse analogy, but you know if you look at like I don't know, 
an impressions painting, whatever, and you think, oh, it's so pretty, but it seems like a kitsch, right? But at the time, it was an avant-garde radical. Right, and, and, and the, fact, art, yeah. the fact that all sorts of other transformations in the way we look at the world has a similar character. Date from this sort of initial moment. In other words, it's, it's, it's because of, you know, take even the word revolution, right? You know, there's a book by I. I. Cohen which talks about revolution in science, right? The word revolution for most of its existence, right, meant something that went around. So in other so words, like a recycle. A recycling. So in other words, the, the original notion of revolution was like the wheel of fortune, right? Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's up and somebody's down, but it's all basically the same, mm -hmm. right? Whereas like the modern point. notion of revolution, you know, even in, you know... Is that something changes that you can't go back? Is that something changes and you can't go back, right? And, and that possibility of thinking that and the normalization of that mm -hmm. in politics, even in the way that, you know, the Arnold Meyer quote has something that is feared or that doesn't seem on the agenda, right? I mean, you could say that a lot of... It's fear because, again, something new and different is emerging rather than just a cycle repeating. Right? Because the cycle repeating, you could at least say, well, things might be a certain way now, but they will return to the way they were. But the modern notion is that something has fundamentally changed that can't be returned. Right, and and you when you look and that's at, why you fear it. And way. when you look at the restoration of the monarchy fund of Louis the Eighteenth, the brother of the king has his touch cut off. It's right? not the same. He has to accept the shock, the charter, right? Which is like <clears throat> basically accepting the principles in I mean, even on the most reactionary basis, there's already some acknowledgement. Yes, seventeen eighty nine occurred. Right? So there there isn't really a going back. There's a kind of conservative transformation of it, but in some way, there's a knowledge that that even the people who most want to go back can't can't go back, and that the desire to go back itself is a, is a recognition of some transformation. Yeah, is there a reason why I can't go back? There's some sort of what pressure was there to not go back. Well, I, I mean, you know, the traditional answer would would. Marx would be, be objective reality. But I mean, part of the answer is it's just that, that too much had changed in the way people think, right? But also in the way they actually lived. Um, in the way they lived. I mean, first of all, there were too many imperial <clears throat> interests that were impossible to overthrow, right? You couldn't just go back and simply restore something. There wasn't enough, you know, you, the Allies couldn't have, have overthrown Napoleon if they said, okay, we have to just completely obliterate the last 30 years. It just wouldn't have been acceptable to French society. That's the material reason. But beyond the material reason, there's just the fact that... To spell that out a little bit, um, you know, the, the social relations of the countryside change. But also, um, you know, what, what Richard started out talking about, about the highly heterogeneous state um, and the kind of semi-holdovers from... Um, medieval feudalism, um, from a kind of late medieval feudalism, however vestigial they were, they were still part of the practical everyday life of the way society functioned, and all of that was gone. And so the way people got their needs met um, were no longer according to customary arrangements. Uh, they had, uh, I mean, even money, right? Didn't they have like local money and national money before the revolution? And certainly yeah, like, different and yeah, they yeah. certainly didn't have paper. But like, and all that is gone, and uh, the role of the church is gone. Uh, you know, and of course, the kind of <coughs> rights that emerge in the revolution have a practical significance. So, the right to personhood, the right to kind of engage in contracts and contractual relationships, uh, that becomes the way that people actually practice their lives. And so, you can't undo that. You can't return it to a traditional way of life. It's a there's an interesting side note on this, and then like, so there are studies now about like the you know <clears throat> empirical studies about you know the countryside which tend to be neglected, and so a lot of these studies show that actually, for example, aristocrats continue to own a lot of land, right, and that there was maybe less shift in property than people assumed. So one answer to that is say, oh well, not that much changed, right? But that but to look at it and say, well, you know what? 
you know, maybe aristocrats still own like 40% of the land in France and in 2030. But really something fundamentally changed, right? Because the aristocrats who owned that land had really, in a way, just become bourgeois landowners, mm -hmm. right. right? In other words, yes, the people, the same people or their descendants, right? You know, still had a disproportionate influence in the countryside as sort of notable, and this continued well into the 19th century, right? That's true. And so you can say, well, maybe the French Revolution was never radical. But they, they weren't doing it in the same way. Their role is different, right? It's not the same. It wasn't titular, it was private property. Yeah, and, and it wasn't, it was private property without. Like we disposed of in a way that the old title things were much more enmeshed in traditional kind of arrangements. Right, and, and the result of that is a, is a transformation <coughs> of, of the entire, you know, thinking of the society. Um, but I just wanted to say something also about the terror, and it goes back to the Russian Revolution point, I want to say it before I forget it. So, um, there's, a, there's a paradox that I, I've become quite aware of, and I'm not sure how to deal with it, which is that, that the Russian Revolution, right, in terms of its imagination, and you see this in terms of statements that you know, Lenin and Trotsky and people made. The sense was, we won't go through the terror, right? We, the, 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 the new socialist revolution will be a humane revolution. We won't need to go through the terror of the Russian revolution. The terror was needed at that time, but our revolution is going to be different. And there's actually like this anecdote of this woman, I think her name was, it's this woman, an American, a uh, sympathizer with the Bolsheviks, is in Russia in 1918, or whatever, and she hears stories of the Chekhov resorting to terror. And That's just, the secret police. Yeah, the Kesvarania Commission, right? The, the Extraordinary Commission, which again is the kind of name. Kind of like the Committee of Public Safety. Yeah. And, um, in fact, you know, the KGB's original. It means the Committee of State Security. Mm -hmm. um, so, and she goes to some guy and he says, no, 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 no. You know, this, this leader, and he's like, no, no, the, the French Revolution was over 100 years ago. I'd like to think we've made progress since then, right? And like we, you know. And of course, now we know that the Russian Civil War was far more bloody than anything that took place in the Oh yeah, it was far, far bloody. Far more bloody. Like tens of times more than the Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at the total total amount of people killed in like, the terror, and by the top estimates, you're talking about you know, tens of thousands, right? Like if you include everything. And you right? include the peasants in the countryside who are in insurrection. Yeah. yeah so But so, in the city of Paris it's much less. Right, you know, so you know the September massacres, which, you know, again are horrible things. You're talking about, you know, Probably a bit a thousand people. Population of mm -hmm. You know, so so by modern standards, you think about what's going on. Now you know what the goal of the revolution is. <laughs> <laughs> the massacre the Nestor College community. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this isn't this isn't a country of like the twenty-five to six million people, right? So I mean if you compare that to the levels of violence that we're used to in the twentieth century, that is not. It's much smaller. It's much smaller, right? I mean, it was shocking at the time, but you know. How big was Paris's population? Paris was probably about five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand. Yeah, it's pretty it was small. Just, so yeah, by our standards, but it was the same. Nothing like London. Year. Nothing like London, though, because London's much bigger. Um, also, London, about sort of like London was probably about fifty percent bigger. About the and those the are the two biggest cities of the city. Who, who, who? The rabble, you know, I mean, the Well, that's, the okay, that's a very good point, and that's actually, fun, that, that's actually a fundamental understanding. So, you didn't, what you had was small-scale artisan production, and like one of the points, I think it's so bull, makes, he says, he says, you can't think of it really as being a proletariat, right? right? So, there were, 
there were people who worked with their hands, but you often had like you know apprenticeships. Um, so there were class distinctions, obviously, but you didn't have the modern factory. You didn't. So so the the worker, right? The worker who was the small scale artisan thought largely in what you would call in classic Marxist terms in petty bourgeois terms, right? Well, right, so they're like guild apprentices and things like that. Right. And so the, but they you didn't, have they didn't, different kind of... Right, but you didn't, you didn't have like a, like a, like a, a movement, like you, when you think about like, like, you know, for example, the Bolshevik Army had these huge factories, right? You know, the workers would take over some huge factories. Right, it's not like that at all. Right, you didn't have any huge factories to take up. But in terms right. of the San Kalut, like the, uh, the, those who don't wear breeches, right? So the people who wear pants rather than uh, people who wear stockings and, and short pants. Um, you know, that that could cut across, you know, in other words, it's kind of like if you wore breeches, you were respectable. And if you wore pants, you were not respectable. So the song collude. And you know, it's it could cut across like workplace dynamics in a sense. In other words, the sort of you know, employees versus the proprietors. Um, you know, when we say that it's a bourgeois uh, society already under the Anshan regime, under the absolutist uh, state, um, what we're talking about is how um, certain bourgeois rights had been eked out within the old system, but in a very narrow way. And what the what the French Revolution opens up is the idea that the door should be opened much wider. So that not just you know the um, uh, the guild master should be respected in society, but the journeymen and the apprentices should too. Right and and the revolution creates a reversal of values, right? So the people the person who works with his hands. The, the, I mean, it, there's a lot of the rhetoric. I mean, the rhetoric is basically what we would think of nowadays as a populist rhetoric. Yeah. Right? But it's not like our populism, which is demagoguery. I mean, it is. There was, there a, was a great deal There was a great deal of demagoguery. <laughs> there was a great deal of demagoguery. <laughs> but, but there was, like, like, within that conception of the people, there was also some, like, a, a different type of social reality. Right? The populism of the present is just a way of uncovering the fact that we live in you know, like a mass capitalist society. I mean, you didn't you, you had a bourgeois society, but you didn't have like capitalism on the same scale. You didn't have this mass industrial production. And the you majority, did have people like bankers and financiers. You, had, you, you did have that, and of course they are not for the revolution. They're for the monarchy. Or they were constitutional monarchies. Mm -hmm. right. At the best, yeah. right, the people, um, and and you know, of course, people were not always like in their class category. I mentioned the social, so there were nobles, who were liberal, or even some radical, right? Um, as individuals, yeah. as individuals, and of course, there were. And the other thing I have to remember: is the typical French, per, French person at this time is a peasant, right? I mean, the, I was going to say something about that. So part of the breakdown of the social order. Like part of the chaos, and it's already happening. It's why they have to call the states general. But certainly, um, after uh, you know, with the radicalization, one of the things that's going on in uh, Paris is that you have a rationing system for bread and, and etc. And so, a lot of people who are suffering in the countryside from the breakdown of the system flee to Paris. So the Parisian population does swell. And of course, they're there to get the benefits of being in Paris. But then, of course, the degree to which the government has a hard time providing those benefits to the Parisians, then the new influx of people are kind of like this category of the mob is very, you know, we have to sort of specify it more. If anything, the San Colo early on, especially in the Great Fear, are afraid of people coming and attacking them from outside Paris. Yeah. These wandering. Okay. But the, in fact, the, the yeah. one historian says, in fact, speaking about sort of the period of 1793, says that the distinction between uh, brigandage and loyalism was often very tenuous. So, you know, you had like a period of like a lot of brigands, and a lot of these brigands were laying around robbing people, 
doing it for the king. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, in other words, the right. I mean, and the, the other thing you have to understand is like, it's like when you speak right about way. peasants, you're speaking about people who, see, you're talking about, like, you know, in our society, we live in a modern world where people, even people who are not educated, have some sense of a broader world. Okay, you had people in France at this time who had a very broad knowledge of what was going on in science, the rest of the planet, etc., and a literate society that was bigger than any time we've had. But the vast majority of the peasantry lived very constricted local lives. Right? There was a huge gap even between like the urban working class in terms of degree of understanding of social reality and the peasantry. People uh, in the countryside tended to live out their entire lives in the same way. Right, like and didn't not never leave a five mile radius. So when they have to do mass conscription during the Revolutionary Wars, one of the things that they have to contend with is troops dying of nostalgia, which meant homesickness. So literally being away from your village was such a psychological shock that people died from it. They like just dropped dead from it. So it was like a mass epidemic of nostalgia among the troops that they had to contend with. Because and, people were not used to leaving their village. And, and, and a lot of these people are very large portion wouldn't have even spoken French. That's right. They, they, they speak spoken, local dialects. They were spoken, right? So, so the pe people who spoke French, you know, the literate classes, you know, right? So really you have, you have really particularly the most radical phase of the French Revolution. What I was going to say then is that when Richard talks about that a lot had already changed by the time of the French Revolution, but the absolutist state is already in the sense of bourgeoisified state. That has more to do with Paris than it has to do with the rest of France. Uh, or, or, and, or I would say also, I mean, it really was a, a three-part hierarchy. So really, you have three, you have mass and population, peasants and villages. You have Paris, which is the, the center of the revolution, and then you have the provincial city. You do have some cities. Yeah. Okay, other cities, which actually play a role. Now, most of the provincial cities were supporters of moderate Jacobins. Right? Mm -hmm. So in the Vendée, right, the local bourgeoisie was anti-Vendée, right? So you had the peasantry and some of the aristocracy. And the clergy. Yeah, and the clergy, of course. Rising up to rising up king. against yeah. and and when you when the conflict, for example, with Lyon, right, there, there's a there's a movement of, of federalism, of secession, right, after the fall of the Gironde. What you have Lyon are, is a kind of a manufacturing city. It's a manufacturing city, right? <clears throat> so which more so in many ways than Paris was yeah. the center of the silk industry. So the the people who are rebelling there, right, you have different sorts of People who are really there are the bourgeoisie of Lyon who think that the bourgeoisie of Paris are too radical, right? But they're not they're not royalists, right? They are moderate. They are the Girondin, right? The moderate way, right? So this the, the radicalization leads to a fragmentation of the forces of the left, right? Are, are the peasants politicized in Yes. Certainly. Certainly. So well some of the peasants are rabid counter revolutionaries. Some of the peasants are like in arms fighting for God and Jesus against the Republic. Mm -hmm. Um and, and the king, God and the King. Uh some of the peasants are radical, yeah. right? A lot of the peasants are being conscripted. One of the things we have is the Lave en Nas, people being conscripted into the revolutionary army. So that has two effects. One is a lot of people don't want to be drafted to fight in the army. So there's a lot of draft dogging and then you have to like crack down on that. But also undoubtedly the experience of serving in this army, you know, just people in the United States. You meet people from other parts of France and you have a bigger It's bourgeoisifying. It's a bourgeoisification, exactly. It's a it's a you know um it's where you get educated and where you see the world. But I was gonna say something about the um, economic crisis leading up to the revolution in the countryside of peasantry. So there's a crisis in terms of feeding Paris that's a kind of an endemic crisis that carries through the whole revolutionary period. Um, but there's also a, a general kind of agricultural economic crisis in the countryside uh, from like, the, you know, about 10 years before the revolution. And so 
what you get there is um, what might be considered a kind of overpopulation of the countryside um, that the you know the agricultural economy can no longer support the people of the countryside, and that's in a sense uh, a more fundamental crisis for the state um, because it's a kind of fiscal crisis of the state, but it, it's ramified. <coughs> Um, and it has to do with not only feeding Paris, but also the countryside feeding itself. And the tax issue uh, is part of that. Um, that people are already, uh, in a sense, starving. And so the idea that they're going to somehow... Pay taxes. Yeah, that they're going to somehow feed into the system the way they were traditionally expected to. Um, and that's also part of the bourgeoisification of society that's going on before the French Revolution, meaning that the, um, uh, the absolute state being a modernizing state also means that the, uh, the countryside is actually capable of supporting more people than traditionally. But then, you know, people attribute it to all sorts of things as like a kind of a climate um, there's a kind of 10 years of, of like bad weather. Um, there are all sorts of contingent factors that basically tip the traditional agricultural pattern uh, over. And that, that's, so that is also a source of radicalization for the peasantry. Um, so I have, I have a sociological question uh -huh. to sort of follow Also, up. there's questions from the... Yeah. Uh -huh. um, we've got James Wan and Brian Morley, but anyway, one... One, one quick thing. Um, so the end of like actual serfdom, right, and reorganizing of you know labor as labor you know, in the countryside. How was that you know uh, constitutive of the revolution? And and like you know Richard, Richard, Richard brought up really quick, but boof with like he sounds like an 18th century Maoist. Why? I mean, why wasn't if it was predominantly a peasant society? Why didn't it take the form of some kind of Maoism where you have like the collective you know ownership of land? Because the, because first of all, but that's the most of the support, almost all the supporters were for that. Yeah. And like, why, and like, why didn't some like, kind of like, like, action heard? There were <laughs> peasant, I mean, throughout history, there have been peasant chakri, there have been peasant uprisings. The category of the peasant is itself misleading, however. And I think that Richard mentioned this uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about the difference between being a serf and being a peasant. If a peasant is not necessarily a smallholder, right, although we tend to associate you know, the peasant with like small holding. Um, and so you have a kind of complex system of uh, and small, regionally variegated. Yeah, it's small holding and urban, I mean, not urban, rural like uh, workers. In other words, people who might have their own plot of land but actually have to work someone else's land mm -hmm. to survive. Um, and so it's, it's and a very people have people have mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, but so, okay, so going back to the question, I mean, I said that slightly kind of cheek. So, I mean, the re, Babeuf's plan, if it had succeeded, would have been basically like a left wing insurrection that would have established a revolutionary government that would ideally have created a, some kind of dictatorship that then would have brought the masses along, right? It, 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 it's, it's a, it's a plan for a revolutionary dictatorship, and it's basically a plan for a a, a post money economy, right? You have these like state <clears throat> storehouses, and people will all bring, and everybody will get their equal share, right? It, it was like clearly not like a, a realistic plan, right? So it's not at the. But it does grow organically out of the measures of the revolution itself. It does. It was an extreme version of Jacobinism. It's like, okay, in the Jacobin period, we learned that private property for the sake of liberty, for the sake of the general good, needs to be restricted, right? In other words, that there's a war of the rich and the poor, right? And that to have a true democratic society, you, you have to, you know, help the poor. So the answer is, let's get just get rid of the rich. And we get rid of the rich by abolishing private ownership of land. I mean, you, that was the main thing. You have like this kind of like, pure peasant artisan society. 
is more or less the imagination of Spurgeon. Right? So that was never really on the agenda. It was certainly not even intended by the Jacobins. In fact, the Jacobins were actually mostly for free trade. Right? But they, but they were, they adopted certain social democratic measures, right? Because of popular pressure. And because they wanted it to win the war. State of emergency. State of emergency. Yeah. A state of emergency. Um. I know we've like sorry. So, so, but, so but just James said growth is not index, index. Index for clarification because it's kind of in the same vein. Uh, how much is poverty uh, and unemployment the problem at that point? Because I mean, Marx will write about how unemployment becomes something that is actually intrinsic to capitalism. So, do we have like actually a class of people who are just outside of society at that time, or like, or even beggars employed, or like at least kind of have their place in society? I mean, there were certainly a lot of beggars and paupers. Again, like I don't think that the French Revolution can be understood as a response to poverty. And I think there's a general historical consensus on that, including in the traditional Marxist movement. I mean, the French economy during the 18th century had grown. There was a fiscal crisis, but the population had increased. Uh, it, was not, it was not a problem of stagnation or poverty per se. There was an economic, there was a, a severe crisis under the directory, but I think it was, in many respects, it was a matter of the political crisis. Yeah. And it particularly affected Paris. So I, mean, I, I think that when you, you, you look at that again, you didn't have the <clears throat> problem of unemployment exactly in a modern sense. I mean, the biggest problem. In fact, the early stages of the revolution. Caused unemployment because their nobles were no longer buying like specialized goods, so actually the economy within Paris was pretty much fine up until the revolution. Right, it I was mean, actually the starvation and the countryside that precipitated more <coughs> of, a, of a political crisis for the state. Exactly, and so one of the you know when you know when the, at one point the Jacobins were like, like they defeated the law and they're like okay let's destroy we all you know and like let's kill the and it's kind of like, well, you know, you kill the Lyon bourgeoisie, and then you have all these people will be unemployed, right? There was no sense of like, okay, we'll nationalize the silk factories, right? That was not seen as like a viable objective. What the state intervention was mostly about controlling prices and at certain points controlling wages, and that was basically to make sure that bread was available to the population. Right? So the biggest problem of inflation was that the assignat, that the prices went up. And so James Let's said, just look at a couple of <clears throat> questions here. One is, he much earlier in the presentation, James had written in Robespierre is not a dictator, the National Convention delegated legitimate emergency powers to the Jacobin-dominated Committee of Public Safety. Cops. And Robespierre directed the Committee of Public Safety to persuasion. That's true. Um, and then Brian Worley uh, asks, contrary to its naturalization, um, what about attempts like the Jacobin magazine, the namesake being the Jacobins of the French Revolution, to bypass the Bolsheviks and return to a kind of 1789 imagination of revolution? What about that? Um, and he rephrases it, since the context in which uh, he asked that question in the talk, what are the politics of the appropriation of the Jacobins by the left, by like Jacobin magazine today. Okay, so let, let me address James's point. I mean, yes, of course, Robespierre was not a dictator. If he had been a dictator, he couldn't have uh, fallen the way he did. So the, all of those powers were, yes, that's quite true. It, it was not, he was not a dictator. It was not a dictatorship. The Committee of Public Safety actually was in many respects politically heterogeneous. It wasn't so you never had, you know, it wasn't like, you know, speak about like a one-party dictator. Yeah, the Jacobins weren't a party. Like they that. weren't a party. It wasn't like, like, it wasn't, Robespierre was not a dictator. I mean, to say that Robespierre was not a dictator, though, or that the powers voted were legitimate, I think begs a lot of questions about the nature of the text, right? In other words, it's not a question really of Robespierre's personal responsibility. It's the sort of the sense of, well, was the terror necessary, right? Um, so the, also the international dimension. Yes, OK, so I'm not sure which part of the international dimension. One thing I should say is that obviously the French Revolution was in many ways unique. But the 
period of the French Revolution and of the American Revolution, the late 18th century, was a period of widespread um, bourgeois radical turmoil. In other words, if you say that the French Revolution invented the category of the left, in some ways you have to say that that category was ready to be invented, right? Um, the most important event in sort of world history, of course, at the time is the American Revolution, but you also had sort of political turmoil in, in, in Britain in the 1780s, in, uh, in Belgium, I mentioned in, in, the, in Holland. Uh, so th when the French Revolution happened, in a way, there was already an international climate of opinion that was prepared uh, to understand its significance, right? So, so I said, well, the French Revolution gave birth to the concept of the left, and obviously, in some ways, there was a kind of proto-left already in existence. I mean, what I wanted to say, following on James' question, it's worth emphasizing the global dimensions a bit more, he says. The revolutionary armies of the Republic largely rolled over the less bourgeoisified absolute monarchies of Central and Eastern Europe. That's true, because Napoleon ultimately is able to take over all of Europe except Russia. Um, now, Richard, you mentioned the, um, the English Revolution and the English Revolution as being the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution as being localized phenomena. But of course not really, right? In other words, they are part of a, a global unfolding, including the Dutch Revolt, obviously the Protestant Reformation, the religious wars, of the 17th century, um, and uh, you know what we can say is that the English Revolution of the 17th century set the stage for the French Revolution of the 18th century, of the 1700s, in many respects, um, and it also you know affects uh, more than just Britain in terms of the social structure. It affects Europe more broadly, but especially France. And part of that is accelerated by the competition between the British and the French throughout the 18th century. Um, and I think that that's where uh, we need to see the French Revolution as a continuation of the English Revolution, which they themselves understood in large measure to be the case, meaning that they wanted what the English had, namely responsible government, the constitutional monarchy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, um, the Enlightenment as a background in uh, the 18th century is a cosmopolitan phenomenon, but the degree to which it takes place in France, it, it is in direct dialogue with events in, um, in Britain and also with thinkers of, uh, of Britain. So the importance of someone like John Locke, who's a thinker of the Glorious Revolution in England in the late 17th century, on the Enlightenment is profound. Uh, the influence on someone like Rousseau is profound. Um, and so what you have is a kind of crisis within the global bourgeois revolution as it's unfolded up to that point. In other words, there's a question of um, the degree to which uh, the essential British-French rivalry is transformed as a function of the French Revolution. Um, so, you know, what James raises about the Revolutionary Wars then has to do with, well, why, are, why is the essential Revolutionary War between the British and the French? Because it's the British who really prop up the, um, the reactionaries in continental Europe against the French Revolution. Uh, they funded, they, you know, the, the war is funded, clothed, armed by the British. It's not out of its own in indigenous resources that the Austrians and the Prussians and the Russians are able to do what they do. Um, it's with British support. Without the British support, it couldn't have happened. Um, and I know that that's what he's raising here. Um, so Ashley asks, well, Reed asks, why did the British support the counter-revolution? But Ashley asks, um, the difference between the nobles of the sword and the nobles of the robe, something that Richard raised earlier about how you had a kind of bourgeoisification of the aristocracy through it becoming part of the state apparatus of the absolute monarchy. Well, I would I would say okay, so so that the noblesse of all the noblesse 
So really, the number to pay was the original um, nobility. Right? The feudal aristocracy. Right, so the noblesse de robe was a kind of professional, ennobled, uh, noble by virtue of like holding office. State commissions. State commissions. You see that in uh, Tsarist Russia as well. So in other words, if you are an educated person who becomes a functionary of the state in Tsarist Russia, like in absolutist France, you might be given a title. Um, so, so, I mean, the, to you go back to the... In fact, you necessarily had to be given a title in order to do your job. Right. In order to serve the state. Right. It, it, I mean, it, that that is true, except that in the context of France, there was a kind of social distinction between these two. The real aristocrats and the, the real kind right. of fake aristocrats. More so than. Um, so, I, I mean, with respect to the question of Jacobin, I mean, Jacobin. I think is just the way. You mean Jacobin magazine? Jacobin right? magazine is the way of just like instead of saying well we're just social democrats or something, it's a way of embracing a kind of image of a populist democracy, right? In that sense, it seems to be a kind of a harking back to a kind of nineteenth-century liberal. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember, the image of the Jacobins was not like furnished not by Marxists; it was furnished by nineteenth-century liberals. So, for instance, um, George Clemenceau, right, who is, uh, he's president or prime minister during mm -hmm. World War I, he's president during World War I of France, he's a radical, and the radicals of the Third Republic see themselves as in this radical Republican tradition, meaning as opposed to Bonapartists or monarchists, they are Jacobins. And opposed to the socialists. Certainly, right. Um, in, fact, in fact, in some respects, the Social Democrats and the Marxists of the Second International were more distant because they felt the need of a historical gap from the Jacobins than people to their right. Um, that's right. Um, I, so that's part of the imagination, you know, that, that uh, Brian's asking about in terms of, you know, Jacobinism today, how do we understand Jacobinism today? Um, there's no such thing. Right. I mean, what. Jacobin is just the name that one appropriates to speak of yourself as a radical democrat. And calling yourself a radical democrat now means something totally different from the 18th or early 19th century. And it's a way of avoiding the, the question of socialism. The question of socialism. Right? It, it, it's in me. Um, I actually, like, uh, like I, I forgot I was going to read these questions. But um, actually, it was sent by Yeja some questions. And like one of them uh, is actually uh, relevant to sort of the point that James brings up. So uh, it, they're actually in, in German, but I'll, I'll translate. So um, he says, uh, in Platypus written is there also an emphasis of the Anglo-American after. So in Platypus, there's a big emphasis on the Anglo-American Enlightenment and the maritime bourgeoisie. Um, in German, and I presume continental cultural realm, this is rather unusual. The classical revolutionary bourgeoisie is what one sees in, in France in 1789, uh, stands for the bourgeois revolution, uh, sort of pure, pure and simple. Um, um, so what's the relationship uh, <coughs> between the French and English uh, bourgeoisie, and how is it that England seems in 1789 more conservative than France? This is also Reed's question about so, why the British support the counter-revolution. So again, like I think that that it's that, that's a little bit simple. I mean, I, I, I think that why do the emigrants go to England? Well, so a lot of them went to uh, to Austria. They went all over the place. A lot went to England. Emigres went up. I, I, okay, I, I would put it this way. So one is that the wars that are fought between Britain and France are to some extent continuations of earlier wars. Um, and the, the role that the, that the French army plays, either the revolutionary armies or the Napoleonic armies, is certainly progressive. Um, I, I think that if you, you look at sort of the, the, 
the, the question about the British role. I mean, I think that if the revolution had sort of stopped in, say, 1790, right? If it had stopped with a constitutional monarchy, I think that the, the sense of the British as the great counter-revolutionaries wouldn't have occurred, right? Britain enters as a counter-revolutionary force basically when it fears that the continent will be dominated by France. And um, that's more a geopolitical question than a war of ideology. Um, there's obviously an ideological component. I mean, I think that the question of why Britain seems more conservative goes back to the question of what the difference was between the British Revolution and the French Revolution. That the French Revolution is much more fundamentally radical and universal, and one might say philosophical. That it, it, the British revolutions had a more limited and particular character that actually expressed the fact that Britain was the most, in a sense, the most advanced country at the time. I mean, James might give a more, a different interpretation uh, and he certainly knows a lot more about Britain at this time than I do. Um, I think that what for me is more puzzling is to actually understand the ideological heritage and meaning of the French Revolution. Because it, 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 even the way the French Revolution is exported isn't quite the same way as the Bolshevik Revolution. In other words, I think this, it's very easy to think like, okay, Jacobin is the 18th century equivalent of Bolshevik, right? And the war against Jacobinism is like the war against the Bolshevik Revolution. That's not right. really the case, and particularly with Napoleon, it's not really the case. Um, and you also have like the paradox that the French Revolution is both the universal revolution, wanting liberation for everyone, and it's a very nationalist revolution, right? Um, you know, there's a way in which the world of the French Revolution becomes, creates also nationalism as a problem. Not in its later reaction and form, which is a problem <coughs> basically the post-1848, but it does create the problem of the nation, right? Which had hitherto not been the case. So, you know, when, for example, in the Seven Years' War, you know, France is at war with Prussia, you know, Voltaire is like really pleased. Frederick the Great's victory. And like there's a kind of cosmopolitan layer, well, you know, you're fighting a war, but but that doesn't mean that there's no sense of the demon. Citizenry. Yeah, there's no, no real citizenry. sense of citizen citizenry. Right? And even during the Napoleonic Wars, you know, you have like <coughs> you know, In other words, the right, it would have been seen as dynastic wars. Mm. It would have been seen as wars between monarchs, um, in which the people are you know, bound up, of course, but not like right, so, patriotism. So, right, so the part, one of the consequences of the French Revolution is through its the democratization of society, it um, <coughs> then brings, brings into... Um, I was reading uh, part of the Declaration of Independence, um, because of course the American Revolution also has this character of patriotism. And there's a paragraph in the Declaration of Independence where they talk about the British, per se. And basically it's, you know, well, unless you rise up against the king also, we have to consider you our enemies in war. Like, you'd be our friends in peace, but enemies in war. Because we're fighting against the, the British monarchy. And um, so, you know, it's unfortunate, but it is the case. So there's a kind of paragraph in the Declaration of Independence on patriotism. Um, you know, like how it's the Americans versus the British. And it's it's interesting that it has to be justified in the way that it is. And, and also, and also it's, but isn't that the, the kind of revolutionary aspect about nationalism also that kind of you have this breakdown of the great chain of being sort of, and you can kind of think of yourself on equal terms with with someone who would be previously in the noble state and someone who would be Right, so, so, so nationalism begins as a democratic impulse, and so the people are praised as patriots, right? It's the equality of everyone in the nation, right? And I thought you were going to say something different, which is that the breakdown of the church 
also mm -hmm. means a different way of considering your participation in society. Yeah, the same like thing. Like, so like, like Christian is like a pre-modern cosmology and so on and so forth. Kind of you're standing on equal terms with, with everyone else. Right, I mean, that's the other aspect, of course, of the French Revolution, that like, it enables Protestants and even Jews to become part of the nation, which obviously... Assas. You have the first uh, sort of like a, a complete augmentation of international law when the French Revolution early on claims that Alsace is part of the French Republic on the basis of the democratic request on the part of the people there. Uh, Alsace Lorraine, the uh, Alsace, Alsace uh, that it that because the people there want to be part of the French Republic, they are. As opposed to the old manner of like conquering a place and therefore it belongs to our nation. Yeah, Louis XIV was totally unconcerned about the wishes, of, I mean, even in form. Mm -hmm. And you and the interesting thing is, speaking about Alsace, is so up until 1789, you had German princes yeah. who had feudal rights in Alsace, mm -hmm. right? So Alsace was sort of not German really part French. of the empire, but it was German. And so even this sense of like what a border was, and you had right. like. You had like the enclave of like the papal state at Avignon, which then gets annexed. And you know, of course the revolution does away with all that, it rationalizes <coughs> it, it gets rid of the old provincial boundaries, it creates the Apartment. You know, when they spread the revolution to other countries, they try to create like rational states, right? Out of like this whole the Batavian Republic. Mm -hmm. Right. But which is not but again, like in the first phase, it's on there isn't like the same nationalism you encounter later on in the nineteenth century. Right. And the other thing you have to remember is like this is like the we we here, we know the narrative of the literate literate intellectual minds. Right? These are the people who believe in like being a patriot, right? That the average French peasant was in any sense a patriot or had any conception even of the French nation at this point, is pretty dubious, right? And so that was the other problem with the French Revolution, that, that you didn't say, well, yes, we've had a French Revolution, and they're like, you know, France is just this abstraction to these people. They don't know what France is. I actually it's prefer to call it the Great Revolution rather than the French Revolution, because at the time, that's what it was called, the Great Revolution. It's not really okay. a French Revolution. But, but, but the, Yes, okay, but the it becomes a French Revolution. But the but the revolution speaks the language of the nation. It speaks the language of patriotism. It speaks like all of this modern language that it's But you were a patriot to the revolution. Yeah. You were a patriot to the republic. You were a patriot to the republic and to the revolution. Yes. So it's in the, it's in, and in that sense the idea was that the patriots of all nations had a kind of common Absolutely. Interest, right? Yeah. In other words, a French patriot, and a German patriot, and an Italian patriot, they were, were united in revolution. Stuff. They were united in revolution because there was no, because people would naturally be friends. It's just, you know, kings and despots who create this. Who divide people. Who divide people, right? So this is, of course, why Hegel welcomes Napoleon's uh, victory at Vienna against That's the so Russians. Good. And on the question of revolution, because you, because you started out of, out of that and kind of like the present narrative about the French Revolution, um, I mean, there's many questions basically that I have about that. Um, on one sense, kind of like what the revolution is now for the right today, and what, what, it, what it presents itself as for the left today, because I don't know, like, <coughs> could you really say that the left is kind of, it adopts this like anti-revolution as a political change? Motive that you see on the right, kind of, or I don't know. I'm just thinking back because I, I went to this. The Tea fight. Party is pro-revolution. That's what yeah, they call this, themselves. What the Tea Party. What does that mean? I mean, revolution means conquering. At, at some at some point in history, begins meaning conquering state power. Yeah, the Tea Party wants to take over the state. Absolutely. So, so I I think as far as specific. And then and then for the right, like isn't like 1989 also understood like these terms? It's finally bringing to an end what 1789 had begun. I mean, I think there are people from this. I think that, that, again, the question of how the revolution is understood, I think it's really the shift more is on the left than the right. Yeah. Right? So the right, again, it depends on what you mean by the right. So, of course, the, from the beginning of right, because traditional right. Yeah. Right? Terrible. The yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I mean, there's like still, um, 
What are they called? Okay, like, that, that, but that hostility. Pretenders. No, but that hostility to the revolution, <laughs> That's right? So then, then in addition to that, there's like the Burkean. Right. Kind of romantic. Okay, the Burkean right is actually a kind of liberal position. They which are. is right, Burke was not against the or the the, the at least the sixteen eighty nine. But he's he was like, for a constitutional monarchy. He was for a constitutional monarchy. Because right? the idea is that you ennoble humanity by having the constitution recognize a monarchy. Like, right. Now now so so the first phase the first phase, like then you have of the of the early 19th century in France. So the early 19th century liberals, and then the later 19th century liberals or radicals under the Third Republic, and then various Stalin, like lots of people in the 19th century thought the French Revolution was a good thing, right? It depended on what country you were, but I mean that's my point again about like Russia. Right, so before the Bolshevik Revolution, most Russian liberals would have been pro-French Revolution, pro-Jacket, right? Uh, the July Monarchy in 1830 adopts the tricolor, which is the French Revolution. It, it adopts the tricolor. So the, the real shift in terms of the understanding of the French Revolution is that the left, right, no has given up on, first of all, the notion of the bourgeois revolution. And that notion is connected to the giving up on Marxism. Right? So the shift on the left is basically a shift in an attitude towards Marxism. So you can't really talk about what is your attitude towards the, the French Revolution without talking about what is your attitude towards Marxism. So the historiographical transformation of the discourse of the French Revolution post -war, is post-World War II, and it's much it's really new leftist. Well, there are actually two moments. There's a moment starting in the 50s, which is a, an Anglo-American Cold War liberalism. And then there's a new leftist move, right? But both of those have an anti-Marxism. It's actually the first of those moves is in some ways the more coherent of understanding, right? It's kind yeah. of like, well, no, you didn't need a revolution. You could have been just sober Anglo-Saxons, right? And the social revolution doesn't really apply. You know, it doesn't really fit the model, and here's why, in parallel, right? The, 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 the deeper challenge, I think, is that this whole problem, in a sense, is in danger of being lost. In other words, the whole concept of a bourgeois revolution, right? However you want to think about that, and the idea of a bourgeois revolution as sort of a historical necessity, is no longer intelligible to most leftists. So what's the problem? Revolution. Right. It's, and maybe, it's not that there didn't need to be a revolution, but it's just that there wasn't any. Like the revolution right, was there wasn't just any. Right, right. So there the, were like no it, real fundamental. Right. So so you have the old narrative of was the revolution a good thing? Right. You know, Hobbes has a very good book on this actually, and he says you know until recently, everyone took it for granted that the French Revolution was a terribly important event, right? And if, you know, before I started reading, like some of the that it was good and necessary, but that it had some excesses, mm -hmm. or that it was not good. Right? There were people who were against it, but but the central significance of it was held to be obvious. <clears throat> right? What I think has shifted is the central significance of the revolution is not held to be obvious, or that anything happened. And there's a kind of, to my mind, nervous incoherence about that. Right? And you see that in like two books that have come out recently. One is the book by Jonathan Israel I mentioned, right? Where he is pro-revolution, right? But he wants to sort of revive the Gironde. And he begins by saying, well, of course, no one believes the old Marxist interpretation. But the postmodern views don't really explain anything. So we have to go back to the notion that ideology matters. And that the French Revolution was this important democratic thing. So he sees the Bolsheviks as kind of these authoritarian nationalist populists. And again, you know, which is again a, a kind of older Cold War liberal, you know, J.L. Talmud, this Israeli philosopher, you know, Rousseau, the Jacobins, origins of totalitarian democracy. And then this is Eric Hazan book, which is in this People's History of the French Revolution, the People's History of Everything series. It's a Verso book, right? Mm -hmm. And 
Well, you know, it's, I, I approach it, you know, it's, it's not, it's not good, terribly good, it's not terribly bad. But the, so he said, he says something which is fascinating. And, it, you know, it's, he said, so was there a bourgeois revolution in France, right? It's the French Revolution. Of and he said, I refuse to answer that question because I think it's meaningless, right? Now, you know, I read that and I think, like, obviously there's a failure of nerve. Right? Like, he obviously knows that something rests on that problem, so he raises the problem and then he says, well, all of these people who are concerned about this, you know, well, they're just, it's all irrelevant. Right? So, there, there's a way in which, like, well, for him, what is relevant? What for him is relevant, again, I think, is that one can speak about the French Revolution in terms of, like, some kind of democratic impulse, but of course there's the problem with the text. Right. right, so it's basically, I mean, that gets back to the question of, of you know, what is the relevance of Jacobin? But also right. it's a political event. In other words, the real question, when you raise the question of bourgeois revolution, is its social content. Um, and I think that, Richard, you've kind of elided that a, a bit in the sense that uh, you talked immediately about the bourgeoisie. And, you know, that's not the way we would normally talk about it in Platypus, meaning it's not a matter of the capitalists or the bourgeoisie or the financiers or what have you. It's rather a question of bourgeois social relations and how the revolution fits into a story of bourgeois social relations. Why the British were counter-revolutionary? I think that you know probably the British, if you will, are of uh, multiple minds about all sorts of things in the 18th century, but that you could find a coherent perspective uh, in British politics at the time of the, uh, the French Revolution, where the idea is that um, the British had defeated the French with respect to, like Adam Smith, for example, that the British defeated the French in the Seven Years' War um, as part of the unfolding of an empire of trade and commerce, a kind of new global system that you needed to kind of beat back the French reactionaries and make France play according to the rules, essentially. And that you needed a gradual modernization of France. And that the revolution could be ambiguous with respect to that, meaning that it could be part of the story of what you needed to do to modernize France, but it, its excess has also endangered that process. And I think also, I mean, there was also, I think, a fear of domestic anxiety and Jacobinism. There is. And um, again, that's the question of like mob rule, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a great deal of controversy within British politics, within British parliamentary politics in the, in the, towards the end of the 18th century that feed into the fear of Jacobinism. But still, if you were to say a kind of moderate, kind of British, liberal, bourgeois perspective at the time, it would have been Yes, of course, France needs to be modernized, needs to become a constitutional monarchy, needs to have a responsible government. And that, you know, again, it's not like some kind of pure zero-sum game in terms of great power competition between the British and the French. It's rather that the French state obviously is retrograde in comparison to the British state. So, so in answer to the point about whether I elided something, I mean, the problem, I, I, I suppose that I did align something, and I suppose I did speak in terms that are not common in Platypus, but there's a problem here, which is that, that the terms I'm using to describe the process are those traditionally used in terms of the leftist and radical history. They are the terms that Lenin and Trotsky use. They are the terms of the liberal and radical historiography. And the, one of the things about the question of the social uh, social structure is that to some extent the revisionist critique of the traditional historiography is actually a critique of the political in favor of the social, right? So there's a way in which... The, you mean the Fure? Yeah, well, Fure, but also the general sense that the real significance is the is again the social. And Since Edmund Burke was raised, I just would remind that he thought that the problem of the French Revolution was that, in a sense, it was too bourgeois, meaning that um, this was going to give rise to the to the 
rule to the social domination of money, lawyers, and so sophists. <laughs> right? Sophists? Yeah, like, you know, people who just make a specious argument, like a kind of demagoguery. Um, and of course, these are all things that we associate with bourgeois society, with the kind of downsides of bourgeois society, that you won't have any kind of traditional respect for um, social customs, cultural conventions, but rather it will just be this kind of Philistine world of self-interest. And that such a Philistine world of self-interest will be naturally dominated by certain kinds of people. People who can manipulate the law, people who can man manipulate money, and people who can manipulate public opinion through sophistry. Um, and that's true. Like in other words, if we, if we sort of take a substantial view, a kind of all-around view, not just an economic or a political view, but a sociocultural view of bourgeois society, then of course Burke is the first modern conservative in that he's raising the problem of bourgeois society. That he's essentially saying you don't want society to become too bourgeois. He's presenting a quote unquote anti capitalist perspective. Sure. Along with it. Absolutely. Um, and but not but just anti like the but you would probably in a certain sense Agreed. have the same thing, except you'd see the problem as being Anglo American society. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's not, but again, it's not anti-bourgeois in the sense of, or anti-capitalist in the sense of, like, capitalists, right? It's it, because Burke names people who are not the wealthiest or the most powerful, right? He's basically saying, like, a new layer in society is going to gain prominence at the expense of all other social values. That all social values are going to be put through this ringer of a bourgeois mechanism, essentially, in which... You know, the substance of life is going to be lost in favor of the letter of the law or something like that. Um, and so that, you know, again, it's why it's kind of romantic, right? So it's, it's, it's ambiguous because, in a sense, he can only raise that from a bourgeois perspective, meaning that he's British. The British Revolution has happened. And uh, the concerns are, in a sense, very modern um, in a way that anticipates Right, because he says that before the Jacobins went to power. But I mean, the other thing is, you know, the, the whole notion of sort of, if you look at Marxism in terms of the relationship to sort of British political economy, French politics, and German idealism. And there's a way in which there's a, a kind of non synchrony between these aspects, and sort of it's not necessarily the most socially advanced society that produces the most radical thinking, right? The Bolshevik revolution does not occur in... Yeah, it doesn't occur in London. There, there's a way in which like, certain historical specificities in different places allow for different aspects that then Marxism actually represents the synthesis of. Now, I mean, one thing that I am a little aware of, and uh, maybe it's part of the question of the international background, um, uh, is like James, again, I feel like, like he's emphasizing um, Burke and, and Payne. Uh, the Payne, the, the um, I mean, I, I, I think like there's a danger, and, and maybe I'm like more sensitive to it, of like emphasizing to some extent in Platypus too much the Anglo-American aspect. I mean, it's a complicated problem when you look at the historiography of the French Revolution, because a lot of the historiography of the French Revolution is obviously motivated by French nationalism. Yeah. And that distorts even a lot of the best leftist history. I or think Stalinism. Or Stalinism, but well, Stalinism becomes a variety of French nationalism. But but I but I think that you you also have a problem. I mean, you, you know, and, and of sort of perhaps um, naturalizing the Anglo-American supremacy. Yeah. <laughs> um, the global it, capitalist system. Yeah, and in I other hear. words, you know, the French Revolution. Um, the end result, if you will, of the French Revolution is Pax Britannica in the 19th century. And that's not just a function of the British 
containing and you know, defeating the revolution, but it's also a function of the success of the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, the success of the French Revolution makes the world capable of being a Pax Britannica, you know, global capitalist order. Um, okay, so James is saying no one's emphasizing the Anglo-American Anglo -American rather than the world that requires a global version of society is being emphasized. Um, so London and then New York. Yeah. So would the period between the Seven Years' War and Fall of Napoleon be like the crisis of that? Crisis of what? The crisis of um, the British. Oh no! The British dominance. No, 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 no the crisis of the British dominance. Be, I mean, the biggest crisis of the British dominance in that period, I guess, is the American Revolution. Yeah. But you know, during the war, right, Britain has naval supremacy, right? So, um, really, the question is. Uh, the ability of the French to establish hegemony on the European continent, right? Which and the War of 1812, by the way, is part of the French Revolutionary uh -huh. Crisis. The war between the United States and Britain in 1812 is part of this. Yes, as well as the phony war that takes place between the United States and, and Revolutionary France. Um, there's a lot going on but, in this period. But again, like like one thing that has to be emphasized is that. I mean, I, I don't know how the gentry great. I mean, the reason that France is ultimately defeated is, I think, not military but sociopolitical, right? It's the in a, it's it's the it's the, the weakness of the French revolutionary impulse outside of France. I mean, I spoke about Jacobins in places like <coughs> Italy, right? Those people. You know, or Spain, right? The Spanish. Also. Napoleon's not actually able to unify Europe. He's not, but he's not able to unify Europe precisely because it depends upon military force, and France just doesn't have enough military force to keep policing Europe, right? It, it, but if there was enough of a bourgeois society outside of France, <coughs> would have. But like Hegel, welcoming. Yeah, would would have, have, that would have uh, supported the Napoleonic system then. It would have been possible, right? And that would have transformed the. That would have, I think, meant that there would not have been the Pax Britannica or the British Empire. Now, the conversely, other conversely, though, you could say that the degree to which France was in adequately bourgeoisified before 1789 mm -hmm. meant that uh, the French Revolution was going to encounter all sorts of problems. That um, you know, if you will, you could say that it's the Inadequate bourgeoisification of France that leads to, from a British perspective, right, unfortunate radicalism. In other words, that the, the, the revolution, what James, James brings up here in the, in the chat QA, is that um, the excesses of the revolution are really the chaos of the revolution. <coughs> um, you know, meaning that. Uh, why is France unable to stabilize as a constitutional monarchy? That question <coughs> does have to be posed because that would have been or as a bourgeois republic. Well, or or even as a bourgeois republic, but it has to. I mean, because it can't stabilize as a constitutional monarchy, it has to try to stabilize as a bourgeois republic, and it's not even able to do that. Um, but that's looking at it kind of negatively. Uh, and if it had. Then of course the counter-revolutionary role of the British would have been tempered. Yeah, so I mean you have a weak it's true in some sense you have a, a, a weaker bourgeoisie, obviously. But you don't need it's not just a matter of the bourgeoisie. But you also have like you also have a much more intransigent uh, aristocracy, right? Which is the reason why the French Revolution becomes more radical, because you have an aristocracy that won't give way right, to give a kind of power share. Right, and that th that's an obvious difference. I mean, the other factor, which is obvious, I think, is the question of ultimately of the Industrial Revolution, right. which is taking place in England at this time. Which is taking place in England, and is accelerated by the Napoleonic Wars too. <coughs> um, in other words, the uh, the British do kind of. Becoming the manufacturing workshop of the world, that's also bound up with these wars. The industrialization of France doesn't really take place until the Jordan. Yeah, until much later. Um, 
but this again, the same is true of almost all of the rest of Europe, right? And so, up until 1848, we're dealing with Europe that's still largely peasant, largely peasant, and ruled still largely by agrarian elites, with like some bourgeois participation in the towns, right? And it was sort of the unwillingness and the the, the weakness of support, right? So that that. There's a way in which the Napoleonic Empire <coughs> is itself a product of instability, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> the, the need for further conflicts, the need for war. So, you know, the, the need to enforce the continental system, the Spanish, ul Spanish ul ulcer, the invasion, it, it, it's, it's a sense of sort of needing to keep moving and needing to have another war to keep the system going. Um, so you never have a kind of, so the question really counter-historical would be, could you have had a stable bourgeois republic emerge from the French Revolution, or could you have had a stable imperial system emerge from the Napoleonic Wars, right? Um, obviously the British had no interest in the latter. The question of like, I think the, the deeper political question for us is why you couldn't have had a stable republic emerge, right? Because that would have been the optimal modern idea. Right? And that would have been perhaps more politically powerful <coughs> in terms of. Yeah, so James has been commenting a bunch. Go ahead. Uh, where, let's see what he says. So, um, one of the, so like, why did the British, like, not like the post-1792 republic? Because of instability. Because of instability. That dovetails with what you were just saying. So it's important that the two great world historical statements of the French Revolution are British, or campaign, the most advanced uh, bourgeois society is thinking through the implications of 1789 most deeply. No one is emphasizing the Anglo-American, rather the world, world headquarters of bourgeois society are Emphasized. Yeah, I think there's a difference of emphasis here between me and James, but I mean, it's, it's. So, in terms of left and right, just maybe to kind of wrap up, um, you know, why the question of the left emerges with the French Revolution. Uh, when you're before you before we get to Babubian socialism, which is a different kind of problem, um, the question of left and right here really has to do with the possibility and desirability of uh, advancing the bourgeois revolution. In other words, um, it really has to do with how far and how radical the bourgeois revolution can go. And I think that uh, Richard raised. In the beginning of your talk, you raised that in some ways this is in fact prefigured by the English Revolution, by the English Civil War in particular. In other words, that in the English Civil War you also have a kind of uh, separation, um, a kind of distillation according to left and right in terms of um, pushing the revolution further and towards more radical possibilities. Right. One difference, of course, is the English Civil War leads to a stable Government, right? You don't have the. They have a restoration before. They have a restoration, but, but Cromwell is very different from the Committee of Public Safety uh -huh. in terms of the government. So you have a, like a very unstable political. I mean, the other thing I would say about Babeuf is important to say that, that he may prefigure socialism, but he's a communist, not a socialist. And that's actually an important distinction. Because socialism, really, the word comes about the end of 1830 or something. <coughs> and socialism really begins to be put on the agenda with the Industrial Revolution. It's really the experience of industrialism and the new conditions that it creates that make socialism. Communism is still an you mean like idea. ancient ideal. It's an ancient ideal. And the word communism long predates socialism. So it's That's a because moral... the term society is a newer term. It's, 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 a, it's, a, so it's a moral position, right? 
In other words, communism is. The communism, so, so Babeuf is actually not thinking in terms of a society of economic growth. He's thinking basically of a, of a static society where there will be an egalitarian distribution of wealth. In other words, there won't be any. Right, so the distinction that Richard's making here is between uh, a focus on distribution versus a focus on production. And static dynamic. Yeah, well, that's bound up with In that. fact, it, but if there's no emphasis on the problem of production. I mean, his set image of production is just peasant it's production. It's just the state takes everything and distributes it into, you know, the universal storehouses for life. And one of the criticisms that he was raised against was, so well, what about artists? You know, what place do they have? What, and there's a very strong, I mean, Babeuf is an interesting character. It's a very strong anti-intellectual, <coughs> right? Babeuf has this attitude, you know, right? He, one of the things, one of his pet peeves is like the idea of brain work. You know, people think brain work, so much of brain work, but I, you know, the real work is just stuff that people do with their hands. So it, it, it's not like, like as an ancestor to like some notion of the left, right, except for its historic position, like anybody who put forward a Babeufian notion today would be people we would think of as like really bad leftists, right? But there's a way in which like in the historical context <coughs> it represents a radical new way of thinking. That yes, we can actually have a revolution that will, you know, get rid of private property, right? We don't right, which the Jacobins are not thinking about at all. Right? They're thinking again the problem of virtue. Right? The terms of the Jacobins are virtue, uh, uh, patriot, right? The negative terms are the corruption. Virtue, patriot, the negative terms are corruption, aristocrat, right? Um, it's, a, it's a completely, you know... Different social imagination. Different social I mean, imagination. Babouf, it's not like Babouf just had this perspective. Babouf came to this perspective. Right, it's um, the failure of Jacobinism that produces Babeuf. So and this it's specifically is, the failure of the directory as well. So right, he's failed right. by the directory, but then he recognizes the problem of the directory. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's he arrives at a position that is a kind of an ancient position, but not by virtue of it having been an ancient position. He kind of arrives at it. The reason that Babeuf is claimed for modern communism is precisely because he's forged his perspective as not just a kind of Christian egalitarianism, but it's forged through the actual problems of the French Revolution and the limits of the French Revolution. You know, it might we might be able to see a continuity with more ancient forms of communism, but that's not where it's coming from. And also when you do look forward to socialism, you look forward to people like Saint Simon. These are people who are a generation that lived through the French Revolution. You know, the first ideas of socialism, you know, Fourier, Saint-Simon, are directly responses to both the problem of industrialism, but also to the experience of the French Revolution. Right. And in some ways, they're conservative and anti-Jacobin responses, right? They're responses that, that say, well, the Jacobins got it wrong, right? So part of the initial impulse to socialism is actually to push away the Jacobin politi total politicization of society. Yeah, this is not, I was going to say, that's not conservative. That's Benjamin Constant, which you started out saying. Okay, right. conservative in quotation. It's not conservative at all. But, but, but the thing about Benjamin Constant is Constant's vision, again, is the liberal one. Right. I'm just saying that, 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 that the synthesis that Marxism makes, right, between like the utopian socialist and the Jacobinism, right, it's that it takes the the, the, the emphasis on the organization of society with the problem of the politicization of society. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I began with the Marx quote, because I think it's a profoundly <coughs> different quote that both recognizes the necessity, in a sense, of the Jacobin in a particular moment and a kind of limitation. So when he says, like, the more perfect political understanding is, the more complex completely puts its faith in the omnipotence of the will, the blinder is towards the natural and spiritual limitations of the will. I mean, I was going to say that he's almost saying the exact same thing as Constant with respect to the Spartans. Uh -huh. He right. is. The Spartan ideal is the Jacobin ideal. 
It's like the radical Jacobin ideal, and it's inadequate to the modern world. In other words, what Marx is expressing here, and it's not for nothing that this is very early Marx, the king of Prussia and the problem of social reform. This is the liberal Marx, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, this is the pre-Marxist Marx. This is the liberal Marx, which is not that he breaks with himself, it's that he develops himself. And in that respect, uh, I would qualify, Richard, what you're saying about the utopian socialists. They're responding to the problem of Jacobinism as a problem of material scarcity. In other words, they're also in keeping with the same perspective, which is that um, the emphasis on politics has as its basis in actual concrete history, in the history of the French Revolution, a kind of um, uh, poverty and Spartan frugality, right? That, uh, that <coughs> the political extremes of the Jacobins comes against their own vision of society, which is liberal, from the emergency situation. And the, the utopian socialists see industrialism as the cure to that. And this is actually something in the history of the left that you see a lot of. Like, so Murray Bookchin, who was a Trotskyist, who became an anarchist, and then became a kind of heterodox anarchist. His idea is that the problem of the Bolsheviks is that they have to deal with scarcity. Meaning, socialism and communism and anarchism up to the 1960s had to deal with material scarcity and therefore had to be politically authoritarian. But now we can have post-scarcity anarchism because industrial technique and science has gotten to the point where we've overcome scarcity and therefore we don't have to be so politically spartan. Right. We don't, it's not just this uniform radical democracy anymore. Um, we can, in a sense, really have anarchism. We can go beyond <clears throat> democracy. We can go beyond a Jacobin vision because we've overcome scarcity. So this problem that you've raised um, is, is an endemic one, and it does feed into the next week's reading group, um, you know, the, what you guys will talk about on, on Wednesday, which is uh, the Constant. In other words, why Constant says, look, you know, uh, the Jacobins mistake modern society for the ancient republic. <coughs> Direct democracy, participatory democracy, is actually not what we need, in fact. Right, but if we specify it, if we say, well, that radicalism is driven by the actual emergency and crisis of the French Revolution, and especially the crisis of Paris in particular. And there's a, there's a fundamentally tragic character to the French Revolution, yeah. which is there's a way in which the problem of the French Revolution really couldn't have been solved in the way they were opposed. I mean, not... In the way they were opposed. They couldn't have been solved. <coughs> That's right. Right. Well, which is different, I mean, you could say, well, but different from... I mean, that's why, like, Napoleon the First is different from Napoleon the Third, And it's also, in a way, different from the problem of the Bolshevik Revolution, because the Bolshevik Revolution, the tragedy exists not so much in the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, but in what followed after. In other words, a series of contingent events <coughs> led to a degeneration of the revolution. Whereas it's not like the French Revolution, say, well, the French Revolution degenerated, right? French Revolution is a more complicated problem, uh, which is the question of, like, okay, did it spiral out of control? What does that mean? And there's a way in which, I mean, you know, when I brought up, like, the various characters of the French Revolution, right? It, it, it's not as though one can simply say, I think, despite like the attempt of a lot of radical historiography, that one simply takes the position that, of so-and-so. It's not like, like in that sense, there's a discontinuity of sort of saying, well, you know, we're Leninists. It's like it wouldn't make, like, like there is an impulse, I think, to say that, of, like to choose the side of Robespierre, but like really the factional issues and the problems posed by it are of a different character. The terms of its success would be unclear as opposed to it's relatively clear what the Bolshevik Revolution prior to. Actually, it's 
more clear, I think, for us what how the French Revolution was a success and could be a success and could have been more of a success. Yeah, I, 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 I think that that's a lot clearer. Um, that the, the Bolshevik Revolution poses like a, a huge question in a way that the French Revolution you can actually navigate it. You can, I mean, what I would say is that popularly, you know, uh, the article from Time Magazine, Person of the Year 2011, Arab Spring Occupied, right? that I use as my opening thing in the relevance of Lenin today, is you know, very straightforward. In other words, American Revolution, French Revolution, both good things, but, and maybe the Arab Spring is good, it's a good revolution, but don't expect it to just be a smooth affair. Meaning, there was a lot of chaos in the American Revolution, and there certainly was a lot of chaos in the French Revolution. And, you know, but essentially on balance, you got rid of an autocratic system, you got responsible government, you got a more liberal society and a more democratic form of government and politics. And so on balance, it's all good. And so this is what we're seeing today. So with Occupy Wall Street, with the Arab Spring, we're seeing right, a kind of attempt to democratize and liberalize through revolution and just don't expect it to be a smooth thing. <coughs> and that's the time that you're kind of seeing like a kind of boy alliance though, like in the ways. Today, yeah, I guess I mean, too. I think between Russia and, and our sphere, eventually, between, I think they're getting a lot. I mean, just looking States, at Syria right now, looking Syria at Syria right now, the United States is just sort of letting Russia get involved so heavily. I mean, I think there's um, more cooperation there than is knowledge, at least uh, a modus vivendi really that, that seems to. I mean, in the case of the Middle East. And these, these occupations and the squares and then these movements against the leadership there kind of really is just trying to keep all of that stable for both for both geopolitical. Aspects. I don't think the United States or Russia was against the Egyptian Revolution. Well, <coughs> I think that they were, you know, and, and Egypt is the country, right? Egypt, Egypt is much bigger than Syria. Not in principle for anything. Someone was telling me recently that. Uh, that there was a connection between Downton Abbey and ISIS because apparently it was more to general than ISIS. <laughs> but they had the both killed off. Exactly, like. exactly. exactly. And she said soon after, like, you know, all this trouble story, therefore, it's obviously the work of British intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> all right, on that note. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, one other thing on the question of, uh, of the left. So, I mean, one of the things that's interesting if you look at, like, the question of the bourgeois revolution is that, like, someone like Daniel Garat, who's, like, the most critical of Robespierre, you see Robespierre suppressing the left. Nevertheless, he still sees the idea of a bourgeois revolution as progressive. Of course. Like, what I think is striking is that, that nowadays, that conception would be absent from the left, right? And I think that's the biggest shift that one registered, that, that leaving aside the question of a bourgeois revolution, there's no conception on the left, because the original revisionism of the critique of the bourgeois revolution was directed against the left holding that notion. But in recent decades, we've seen the willingness of the left to completely abandon any notion of a bourgeois revolution. Did all the historiography on the American Civil War. Yeah. Lincoln is the bad guy, basically. And the North sort of is villainous. Right. There's a lot of similarity to <coughs> to those narratives, except that in some sense that the problem with the French Revolution is sort of deeper and more universal. You know? Is part of that taking bourgeois consciousness and rights for granted? It's distance and it's sort of like it's a combination of that, but it also goes back, I think, to the to the point that our <coughs> that, that there's fundamental anxiety about the idea of a revolution, and it takes so on the one hand you take something for granted, and then the other hand you see it as um, as the bourgeoisie is always reactionary, right? Everything bourgeois is bad, which is kind of strangely compatible with seeing it as as uh, taking it for granted, and even like the Jacobin appropriating the name of Jacobin, itself fits into that because the, I don't think the Jacobin is like interested in holding up a banner of bourgeois revolution. 
It's rather that it stands for some kind of... I mean, what I would say is this. It can appear irrelevant. In other words, in 2015 right now, talking about the French Revolution, it can appear to be just totally irrelevant. <coughs> Meaning all the historiographic disputes could just appear to be tempest in a teapot. And maybe it's just nuances that don't amount to anything of substance. And the reason for that is that the revolution is successful, and so it's just specialists arguing over stuff that doesn't really matter because we live in bourgeois society, we live in capitalism, case closed, it's all done. And so it doesn't amount to anything. What I would say is, and that's why I brought up the Time magazine, is that any major state crisis and popular uprising <coughs> will immediately call back to people's imagination, wait a second, what was the French Revolution again? Right now, in 2015, no, it does not, nobody cares, right? But that could, you know, just a few years ago, people were willing to say, what was that revolution again? What does it mean that people are in the street today? Right, so it will just come back. And in fact, it, it will not be surpassed. In other words, in any political crisis, and that's why I brought up the Tea Party. Right? The Tea Party is a response to the 2008 economic crisis. It's also a response against Obama because they think that Obama is some kind of fascist. Right? Obama with Hitler mustache. You remember those posters? Right? No, because they basically say, you know, well, a, a economic crisis should not be a political crisis that strengthens the state. Right, and so then the imagination of the American Revolution comes back. Yes, it ends since the imagination of fascism. And, and it's all twisted, but it's there. It's going to come back. This is going to be important. So we only neglect it at our own peril. But also, I mean, since you mentioned fascism, fascism, I mean, in the mid 20th century, fascism, particularly Nazism, saw itself as the as the oppos as an opposition in the long historical sense of the French Revolution. Not just Bolshevists. And, you know. and the Cold War historiography identified Napoleon and Hitler. Mm. So Hitler was just seen as a Latter day Napoleon, which is really crazy. But that was the case. Right, but that's again, like, and that's like, that's also the Anglo American bias. Right, that was never true in France. Uh, no, except for maybe the postmodernists. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. <coughs> Shall we adjourn? Yeah, Yeah, right.